guys, it's Michelle, and um, welcome to tonight's stream. I'm at Monarch Moments, and my little sidekick Hannah's off tonight. She's going to be monitoring the chat from backstage. So we just want to walk, welcome you all in tonight because we're going to. Have oh. <laughs> so we're going to be um, uh, having our chef John Fink is our guest tonight. So before, um, before I get into that, I just want to um, welcome you guys all into the chat. So I'm going to say hi to everybody. And then i um, got to turn my phone down. Um, welcome you guys in, and uh, we'll do our little housekeeping. So Daniel Disinfinity's here. Welcome in. Francisco, you're always one of the first ones. You're here. Thanks for coming in. Um, MVP, um, hi. How are you doing, Andrea? I hope you're feeling well. Um, let's see. You're excited. Uh, we're excited too. Um, we've got Carol Karki. She's in the house. I know, I think maybe Carol had one of the questions for, for Chef John. Um, let's see. Mike's here. <laughs> Mike says, Hey John, Mike's in the house. Um, who else do we have? We have, um, Roger Hood, Jay. <laughs> what a smile. He says, what a smile. Welcome in to the stream. Jeff Rhino, um, Bam, I'm sorry if I can't get that right. Bannister, welcome in. Hello, thanks for coming in. And then we've got, um, then we have, uh, let's make sure I didn't miss anybody. <laughs> Hello, we got Adventures by D, um, Dave and Chris, welcome in. And Mike Carell, welcome. We have Mike Wheeler is in the house. Hey, Mikey. Okay. We got everybody. So just a quick note. Usually we do um, celebrations. We do like birthdays and stuff. I know we have a few birthdays um, in the house tonight. Mike, I think you're having your birthday. And I know Tim's having his birthday. And there's one other. So we're going to do those. Um, we're going to do our, our birthday celebration toward at, at the end. So um, we will we'll, uh, remember you guys toward the end of the stream. Because I know I promised I would sing to you. So <laughs> anyway. So without further ado, and Jonathan's here, Jane in Travels is here, um, Frankie, just another Disnard's here. So uh, welcome, welcome in everyone. And I'm gonna be um, kind of focusing on talking to John. So if I'm missing any comments, we're gonna try and monitor them. Um, we're, we're gonna um, put your questions as they come through the chat. We'll try and put them up on the screen. And um, so just bear with us. And if anyone's new, um, welcome. Don't forget, if you like uh, what you see, to subscribe to our channel. It's free. And if you hit the bell, you'll be notified anytime that we do go live. And um, if you hit the thumbs up right now, you can um, let John and us know that you like uh, what's going on with the stream. So first um, is our introduction. So without further ado, we have um, J Chef John Fink is here with us tonight. And he has 30 years experience in cooking in the cooking industry. He's been featured on Man Fire food um, on the cooking channel and also restaurant startup on CNBC. He was named Best Bite of 2014 by the San Francisco Chronicle. So welcome in Chef John Fink. How you doing, Michelle? Thank you. <laughs> there he is. Good. <laughs> We're so happy to have you here. I think you have a few, a few friends uh -huh. in the house watching tonight. So um yeah. Nice way to, uh, to uh, spend a Sunday evening. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we have a lot of people. I think people are excited. Um, and we're going to share a little bit about, um, we're going to we're gonna go through a bunch of different things. But um, I think what we want to get started with first is just a little bit about your background. Like what, um, how did you first become interested in um, cooking or becoming a chef? Like where, what? Okay, uh, it was a dark, stormy night. Uh, <laughs> no, it was actually my first um, tax-paying job at 16 years old. Is I worked. Uh, I grew up in uh, the Philadelphia uh, area, the, the the suburbs, northwest suburbs, and I worked at a at a place called William Penn Inn, old uh, uh, restaurant inn, about uh, way, well over 300 years, and I was a dishwasher there. And little did I know uh, what an impact that had on me. I worked there for about a year and a half, and I was a dishwasher. And I moved into uh, uh, prep, uh, uh, food prep. Um, as I said, it was an old um, uh, uh, style restaurant, colonial. And one of their uh, famous things was snapper soup. 
and uh, snapper, meaning turtle. So my oh. first job as a food prep <laughs> was uh, picking the turtle meat. And uh, oh, yeah, I know, uh, sink or swim. And uh, um, I don't know that I, I knew people ate turtle. Did you all well, know that people well, ate turtle? I, I, actually, uh, they did, and it was a very popular meat, and it was a very, uh, you know, because there's a lot of ponds and lakes, and uh, uh, oh. that was a, a available food, you know, before you started farming, and uh, yeah, snapper soup. So that's an old colonial, way back in the uh, 1700s kind of thing to have, so. Do you like um, turtle meat? Do you eat that? Actually, um, yes and no. I'm not a big fan of the snapper soup. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably because I was, you know, shell shocked. Uh, no pun intended. Um, you know, it just <laughs> depends on the broth. It's it's it's, it's a very rich uh, sherry based soup, um, but it's yeah. just old world, and uh, I like it a little spicy. And it's um, uh, I kind of like the the southern kind of. Uh, Crayoli touch to it. Oh, more okay. The uh, yeah. New England kind of um, uh, plain Jane, uh, but uh, there's a lot of meat on the snapper, and that's why. Yeah. So some people are quite off put by it. Uh, yeah. But you know, when you're 16 years old, it's like, oh yeah, you want to help, and uh, I'm like, get me out of the dish pit. Sure, that sounds great. We have a turtle story we can tell later after the string's mm -hmm. over. <laughs> uh, but anyways, I, moving on. <laughs> So ironically, yeah. I did that for like a year and a half, and um, it's not like I continued on with it. Uh, uh, they had problems uh, with me because I was involved with sports and I needed some freedom. And uh, they were, uh, a li you know, I, could, I I can only work nights, and they wanted me to start working. So, so uh, that got I you, yeah. Senior year, but uh, um. You know, I, I just carried it on. And then when I went to college, uh, you know, the, you know, a, a readily available job was uh, working at a restaurant. And um, when I was in Florida at Embry-Riddle, as you know, uh, uh, I, I, I was working at the chart house uh, yeah. part time. And uh, um, I was a busser and I kept my eye on the kitchen. Uh, they were, you know, throwing out like Scooby's snacks and they uh they moved me into uh uh the salad position and i was like the guy making the caesar salad there and uh yeah and then it you know kind of just you know uh baby steps from there so, so they moved when... me into the uh baked potato section and then the grill <laughs> and so yeah but um, so then you so that's where you got your you you got interested in the kitchen and then i know when you were going to school you said you worked your way through school with these jobs like the chart house and then you did some some uh, commercial fishing right in alaska well actually and, uh, that's actually uh, after uh, what, what kept me in college because uh that's how i paid for it and, right and um i was commercial fishing uh in my neck of the woods in new england in new jersey actually uh uh, Barnegat Light, um, and there's a fishing village out of there. Uh, and I was uh, scallop fishing, and um, I also did some sword fishing and tuna uh, long line fishing. So I did that for about four seasons. Uh, um, and then uh, I also, after that, I actually, I went up to Alaska and I, uh, and I, and I, I commercial, I went, I went crabbing up there for about oh. three seasons, three years. So, and you were telling me something about the crabs, right? We were talking about how you never had crab until you've eaten it fresh off the boat, <laughs> like, right. Or was it crab or oh, lobster? Well, you know, uh, crab is everywhere, you yeah. know, in the, in the, you know, United States, it's, uh, um, the, uh, in the Atlantic, the North Atlantic, uh, the Southern Atlantic, it's in the Gulf of Mexico, the, you know, uh, Pacific up in the Bering Sea. But, uh, you know, in America, I, uh, I got a, you know, I was king crab fishing and, uh, um, you know, that's a larger one. And some of them are literally, you know, kind of six feet from claw to claw when you oh, hold wow. them up. Yeah. That's and, why they're uh, king. I had the opportunity. Um, we were, you know, sometimes uh, we would have uh, uh, Japanese uh, processors uh, where we would catch the, the, the product and then they would process it and you know, cook and freeze it out to sea. And they were cooking, um, uh, you know, where we would kind of 
boil it in, in uh, the, the seawater and then uh, uh, shock it in the, you know, uh, cold uh, seawater and then dip it in this kind of negative 60 kind of uh, brine bath. And then it'd be all ready to be frozen in a box. Well, the Japanese, uh, they would want to do the processing. And I remember like hanging out with them and they would, you know, be making a snack and they would sort of do it uh Different. completely opposite the way we would do where they would just like uh cook it for two minutes and eat it like that and oh uh, i was uh yeah uh but to have a a, a fresh alaskan king crab cook like that and you know the king crab it's called king crab because it's so large but you really have like kind of like a hot dog size kind of crab leg they you know that diameter and that oh length. nice and it's, yeah, yeah it's it's uh uh and when you get it fresh out at sea, um, it's not the same as, as what you get in the lower 48 because, you know, you have to freeze it or cook it and freeze it. And, you know, you can't really undercook it. You got to cook it completely. It. So there's no funny business in the uh, storage process. So. Yeah. So tell us about <laughs> some other some other the places that you worked along the way. Like you, where did you study your um, you went to school? After that, to become so, uh, a yeah, um, culinary. Went, went, went to school at, at Riddle, and then um, I, uh, I I was fishing in Alaska, and I was I decided uh, uh, I, I hit twenty five, and I kind of did it. I kind of hit the pinnacle of commercial fishing, but I decide I realized that that is uh, that was not a career. I didn't want to live my uh, life at, out at sea. Uh, yeah. And, hard. um, uh, I, I, uh, um, and you know, I, I was, I was, uh, it's, it's a young man's job, uh, because it's very physical. They, they loved me on the boat because I was, uh, uh, a large bear, six, five strong. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, uh, and then plus not to mention, you know, I didn't get seasick and I, I actually really love, uh, that work out there. But um, uh, I decided uh, to kind of get into something that I really uh, um, enjoyed and loved, and uh, and that was cooking. And I wanted to get serious about it. And I was kind of starting a little late. Uh, I was dabbling, but not you know not really seriously. So I went to cooking school, and I enrolled uh, uh, at the Cordon Bleu, and. Um, at that time in 1993, there was only four of them. Uh, since then, there's been quite a few, but there was none in the um, United States, but they, they, uh, they, they had one, the main one in Paris. They had a, one in London, one in Tokyo, uh, and then they just opened up one in uh, Ottawa, Canada, uh, in the province of Ontario. And... Um, I decided to uh, enroll in there, and I, I, uh, uh, it's it, uh, I, the, this course I was in was the, the grand diploma, so it's like five courses, uh, kind of a year and a half course, and I took my three courses in, in Ottawa, and then, uh, uh, and then I finished my last two courses in, uh, in Paris, France. So, oh wow, nice. I, I went. To, I, I wanted to go when I finished uh riddle i wanted to um if i i said if i continue my education uh as a graduate i wanted if i was going to do that i wanted to do it in another country besides to get the education but also to get that um uh education oh. of living in another country the culinary and yeah the cultural canada kind of offered that because it was another country it was also the Cordon Bleu was also intense because the curriculum was taught in, Fr in, in French, and uh, you know really? I had I had some French in high school, but uh, uh, that was not. Uh, so enough. you enrolled. And, so you enrolled in a college that the, they taught you in French, but you weren't fluent in French. Yeah, well, see the beauty about Ontario uh -huh. it's it's a it's a you know they speak uh, Canadian French and they speak English. So yeah. I thought I, you know, I could kind of skate by and, uh, but it was taught in, um, in French and it was uh, sink or swim. And, you know, <laughs> wow. I had a little idea. So I, so I really had to learn the language and uh, I can read it. I'm not so confident about speaking it, 
Uh, but I, I was able to manage and I, you know, I, I, I picked it up. So there was a oh, lot, yeah. you know, uh, uh, going on. Um, and then it was also the French cuisine, which of was, course, you know, yeah. the, but it was, um, something that I really wasn't familiar with. And, uh, so it was, um, it was kind of challenging on all, uh, sense on all fronts for me. So, uh, so and you, I did that for a year and a half. So, so when you graduate from a culinary school, is it like, um, just kind of a generic cooking degree? Like, is it a, or, or do you have to specialize in something? So I don't know how they do it now. Uh, but when I was there in the early nineties, uh, it was five classes. So like basic cuisine, intermediate cuisine, um an advanced cuisine basic pastry and advanced pastry okay. and it and it kind of consisted of a uh, class and then a laboratory and the laboratory was the kitchen <laughs> and so you um science project you know uh they kind of did a demo for you and you you know you you, you took your notes and then and then you went into the kitchen and then you uh executed what uh and what I really got into was that it was, and also it was, it was a small school. Uh, there was only like um, 14, 13, 14 uh, students. So I really wanted that kind of, okay. you know, I didn't want a class of 50, which was what they were doing in, uh, in Paris. So, uh, but what I really uh, got into it, you know, I have a, a science background from, from uh, Embry-Riddle, but what I, you know, it, it was like, what really blew me away was that you could have the same exact recipe and you would have like 14 students and you would have all the same ingredients and uh but you would have 14 different final dishes or 14 different flavors and i i was amazed by that so just these little things can really affect the uh you know the the, the, the outcome and for me like at, at cooking school it, it was challenging, but then once I, I think it was like my second, uh, I was there for a little bit and I got a job at nighttime working in a restaurant. Uh, and, you know, so that I had the school and then I had the real world experience and it really kind of came together for me. And that's when I kind of, you know, aha moment, gotcha moment. Um, it all sort of came together and I started uh, performing better in school. Like I did, I, oh, I could kind of, okay. yeah. you know, bring it all together. So that was really, uh, cause a lot of people, cause it is expensive, just dedicate their, you know, uh, you know, themselves to school, but you kind of, for me, I got kind of lost in the process. And I, I, I always liked uh, associations like the real world experience. And uh, that was, you know, highly beneficial. And I was at a really good restaurant and they gave me an opportunity and I, uh, I was able to, uh, 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 do well. Start. So oh, mm -hmm. yeah. do, do well on both fronts, but well at work and then well in school, because, you know, I was struggling, uh, you know, cause it was a different language and just, right. just to kind of, you know, the French cuisine and, you know, it's very, you know, strict. And I always kind of wanted to do something different. And, you know, you really got to, you know, like, it's, that's not the time to get creative. You know, let's, we're going to teach you, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, 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 you know, the mother cuisine. And, you know, I had some pretty strict French uh, uh, instructors, chefs, and, you know, they're, um, they, you know, they try to keep it true. And, you know, right. that's not the time for creativity. And yeah, so. So it sounds like definitely that language, the language was a struggle. Was there anything else that's surprising? You know, it was, you? A it, it, was a it was a struggle for the first like two weeks. And then okay. it was kind of, you know, a lot of people have this experience where you really have to immerse yourself into the culture, into yeah. the language and yeah. you get it. Because, you know, as I said, taking two years of French, I, uh, that, you know, high school, I'm not. I had other things on my mind uh, at the, you know, at that stage. So I don't know if I really, you know, took it all in for all it was worth. But when I immersed myself and it was, as I said, a sink or a swim, yeah. I had to do it. Uh, you know, I got it. And uh, um, so. Yeah. So, um... so there was a lot of learning going on. You know, it was a, uh, a, a, 
you know, learning a, a completely different cuisine, very, you know, like the, the basis of, uh, of, of all cuisines that kind of, you know, piggyback on that, but also, you know, uh, you know, be perfectly honest, it was my first time out of America. And Do so you, being in a different country yeah. and it was uh, like, uh, the, you know, the Gulf War, the first uh, Gulf War one just oh, yeah. sort of ended. Yeah. There was a lot of anti-American. Uh, oh, I was going to say, do you, do you feel? And I, and I, I, I wasn't used to that. So there was a huge, and then not, as I said, you know, it was a bilingual town, but it's right next to Quebec. And Quebec, Montreal uh, area, they're very, very French, French and that's all they speak and they're very proud and very opinionated and um yeah so i it, it was so there is a lot of learning on all fronts like how to deal with a different culture and cuisine and language right. and country and yeah do you think the uh, and teachers then, were not, harder and then not to mention being in florida you know and then going up to canada and ottawa in the middle of the winter uh, you know, where the cows oh. freeze and I mean, yeah, it's just brutal. The uh, climate change, uh, yeah, the weather there. So do you think the teachers were harder on you because of you being, Oh, the teachers are always hard on me. Oh. I'm a marked man, oh, oh. I go. you know, big and <laughs> smiling and like, Oh, we're gonna, no. Um, actually I think, um, I remember they were really complimenting me because I was struggling. And as I said, once I took that job, uh, at nighttime, it kind of came together like, oh, you know, uh, you're doing a lot better. And uh, so I they saw you trying like, yeah, they probably saw you were trying to put that effort in. So as I said, it kind of came together, you know, um, so uh, I, I this I have a question that comes to mind because you mentioned that you're six foot five. So this probably is coming from out of nowhere. But do you find that a struggle, a difficulty? Because the counters are all pretty similar heights. Like, yes you, and no. you have to bend uh, over a lot? <laughs> yes and no. Um, no, no on, uh, you know, thankfully uh, through, you know, sports and, you know, commercial fishing for like yeah. seven years, I have a very strong back. But where I found um, a problem was sometimes the hoods. Uh, you know, you bumped uh, your head line. Yeah. And I'd have to duck in and duck out. Uh, so whenever I tried out for a place, that was the first thing I looked at because, you know, when you got to, you know, juke Eat. and jive, yeah, you don't want to, you know, clock yourself. Uh, um, yeah. And then also you can't wear like, uh, like regular uh, kitchen heavy duty shoes, you know, because six, five, six, six, all of a sudden you're wearing shoe, you know, uh, shoes with uh, a Heels. decent when you're like six, seven, six, yeah. eight. So I would have to wear Birkenstocks, which would be like low, and 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 that would, uh, yeah. Uh, Those are my favorite shoes. <laughs> well, I, I discovered a kind of too late into the game, maybe six years about Birkenstock, but it was like, oh, now I can stand for eight, 10, 12. 14 hours and I'm not like, you know, coming home like crushed with, it's like, God, my feet hurt. So oh, yeah, Birkenstocks were, uh, uh, were a godsend. I'm like, oh, now I can't. See, see, you guys learn, now they've learned something. Uh, they learned yeah, something. If you're on your feet all day, Birkenstocks. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, those German cork insoles and they make your ankle stronger and all that stuff. So what does that say? Do you know Kim? Question for the chef. Do you know Kimball? Kim mm. What is that? I'm not sure. Kimball. Something like uh, Kimball. That sounds, rings a bell. Something <laughs> E or Q. I'm not sure. I don't think it has to do uh, with food. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It could be. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Um, so you worked in some, um, you worked in some really nice restaurants. Um, and I know, so we'll kind of just, we'll touch on that. And then, um, I have a question for you as far as like another cooking question. And then we're going to go on and talk a little bit about Easter, some like Easter, um, foods and maybe some tips on you guys who might be making, um, uh, meals for Easter coming up next Sunday. So we'll, um, talk a little bit about that. Um, so you were, so at, at a cooking school, I'm sorry, yeah. Michelle. Yeah. So yeah. at a cooking school, you know, uh, I, I, I was, um, I went to work in the hotel uh, resort industry in the uh, Phoenix 
Valley area. So I had a, I had a, a, a great opportunity, uh, and I worked at uh, the Phoenician, which was that Charles Keating project, uh, but beautiful, beautiful place. And also the Arizona Biltmore, that's a Frank Lloyd Wright property. Oh, nice. And then, uh, the Point at South Mountain, uh, a Hilton property. So, um, yeah, I kind of, uh, I worked um, because my, uh, uh, some instructors, some chefs that I, uh, looked up to, they said, you should work in a large hotel uh, or resort. And you'll understand once you, you do that. And that, that was, uh, you know, to be a, 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 a small fry and a big operation. But, you know, when you work at these large hotels, you really get to uh, see many facets. It's just not like a small restaurant or a bistro. You know, they're doing everything, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you know, banquets and, you know, and not like banquets oh. for like a wedding, but <laughs> I'm <banquets> still here, <laughs> for, uh, you know, like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people. It's just so you get to, you're, you're, just, you're just exposed to a whole, uh, a whole, um, a whole lot. So uh, I thought it was kind of, I always qu kind of question like, why am I doing this? But later on in my career, I, I realized how you know, I was just exposed. And then, you know, as I said, these hotel resorts, especially in the Phoenix area, they were, uh, you know, golf destinations and, you know, huge, huge properties. So, you know, like uh, uh, a, a resort would literally have like five restaurants and, you know, oh, yeah. a huge banquet facility and, you know, not a, uh, a you know, a 60 uh, small boutique kind of hotel. They would have like 2000 rooms and all these different things. So, yeah, it was a really, uh, um, and a, you know, and a tremendous pool scene uh, before Vegas got popular with their pool scenes and so stuff a, like that. There's a question. Welcome in, um, or if you've been here, KJ uh, for RMZ. <laughs> Welcome in. You have a question for um, Chef Fink. Will you be returning to the Georgia mm. Bouchier? I hope so. Yes, uh, that's my plan. I, I actually attended the... Uh, uh, 2020 last January, and that was my first one. And I, I was supposed to go, and then I had a, uh, uh, a foot accident and, um, um, I wasn't able to go. And now, uh, yeah, that was, uh, but yeah, so what is the you know, a, a whole lot of it there, but that was actually a, a tremendous experience where, uh, you know, we're going to fast forward about 35 years and, uh, <laughs> Uh, where you, um, a, a, a boucherie is a, is kind of a French, um, uh, thing where they, you, um, uh, you're on a farm and you, uh, process the pig, which means you kill the pig. And then you have a whole bunch of chefs and then, uh, you break it into parts and each chef does a dish, uh, from the pig part they got. And it's, you know, you have a whole bunch of people. Uh, you know, like 100, 200. I think we had about 200 people that showed up, and it's a, uh, a real kind of uh, wonderful experience because a lot of you know, because you get to see the pig, uh, and then to process it, which is a whole nother thing, and then to not a lot of people, not a lot of chefs, not uh, you know, and, and even spectators can you know, um get that experience of, uh, you know, from the farm and a, a fresh kill. And uh, it, it, it's something real special. So, so because when you go to a restaurant or anything like that, it's, you know, uh, it, it's in the food system. So, uh, and, you know, you're picking the vegetables from the farm, you're talking to the farmer and you're with a whole bunch of other, you know, chefs. And, um, and then, and then with this bougerie festival, it's actually linked with uh, the, the, uh, veterans, uh, the veterans that are having some difficulty oh, okay. coming back, uh, uh, from their, uh, tour of duty and, and, you know, kind of uh, get back into the fold of society. And, uh, so they actually get to hang out with chefs and people. So it, it's a real, it's a real good, uh, uh, experience on all fronts. So. Yeah. Um, nice. So it sounds like it's a food festival, like all, almost like a farmer's market. I wouldn't say it's that a you food yeah. Well, yeah, it is a food festival. It's very small, special invite only. Um, oh, okay. 
and it's more for the veterans. They're kind of the spectators that show up. Uh, uh, the chefs, you know, you get invited to, you got to know someone to sort of get in. And um, yeah, it was, uh, I, I kind of went there, uh, as I said, a year, a year and two months ago. And uh, it was uh, uh, a great, a great experience. So Well, that's awesome. It sounds like, <laughs> you know, you must be, you must be, uh, well, obviously you're a great chef and they wanted you to come and, and uh, be a part of that festival. I think I was one of the farthest chefs. I came from you wow. know, California, because a lot of them come from the South, because it is Georgia, the middle. Yeah. Of Mitchville. But yeah, that was so that's a complete fast forward 35 years. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but it, as I said, uh, a, a real special experience, um, because um, a lot of people don't really, you know, it's kind of how the whole beast started, which is my, my, my company, but where your food comes from. And uh, you know, a lot of chefs, they work at a restaurant, you know, they order from, yeah. uh, you know, a produce company or a meat company, it gets delivered and, you know, you're, you're pretty far removed, but when, when you actually go to a, a farm and you see the, uh, animals, you know, and how they're, uh, you know, uh, raised and how they eat and the conditions and, you know, and a farm is just not growing animals. They're growing other things too, like here in, in, in and, right. Uh, and, and in California, especially Napa, they're growing grapes, they're growing vegetables, they're growing pumpkins, they're growing uh, <laughs> a couple different types of uh, animals, you know, from pigs to lambs to, you know, steer to chickens. So it's really a whole kind of bio system going yeah, on. Yeah, well, well, we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk some more about that. Mm -hmm. That was another point. I know, uh, Becca, welcome. Um, you have a question about uh, when you when you do a whole hog, do you put seasoning on the whole hog and would you put it in the smoker or do you wrap it? Well, we're, not, we're, we're, we're fast forwarding about, you know, 30 years. Uh, and, <laughs> so, um, so yeah. whole hog, well, that's the whole, um, that's a whole episode right there, but yeah, well, um, it, it, you know, it's great that whole hogs have kind of got back into the, you know, um, fold the things and you know when uh a lot of chefs uh you know have endeavored on in cooking a whole hog but it's a it's a real it's it, it's actually a real challenge because you have to think outside the box and no pun intended because you know in a kitchen especially in a commercial kitchen everything works on a sheet tray or a certain oven so you can't fit a whole pig in an oven maybe a suckling pig and a, when i say suckling like you know, a baby pig, like yeah. eight to 14 pounds, but so, and then, you know, not a lot of people actually cook a market, uh, size pig, which is like 190 pounds to 325. So that's a whole like a different thing. Boar. You need different, you know, uh, yeah. uh, contraptions and, and cooking mechanisms. Uh, a lot of people do uh whole roasted, uh, pigs a little bit more manageable they call them roaster hogs and they're like 80 to 110 pounds and they're a bit more manageable but they still don't fit into a commercial you know kind of area you have to have a smoker or a smoker that kind of accommodates a pig or so you, you have to cook them outside fire and oh. you can kind of build like a pit with cinder blocks or oven bricks or uh some people have like uh you know uh, pig smokers uh, that are specifically made uh, uh, for, uh, you know, cooking a pig. And I like to, uh, I like to like, I, I like to do it uh, the hard way. And uh, some, you know, there, there, you know, there's more, there's no one way to cook a pig, but some people like to season it ahead of time, like two or three days. Uh, some people don't, they just put it in which makes their lives a lot easier. Um, I like to brine it, uh, which means put it into a water bath of like, you know, a salt and herbs and aromatics and uh, uh, solution for like uh, two days. Uh, I find okay. it kind of cleans the pig a little bit too. And yeah. then I season it and then, you know, I do a final seasoning, but brining it kind of keeps it juicier, keep, you know, keeps it moist. Uh, and um 
but you know, to brine a pig is not an easy operation. You need a vessel to put oh, a pig yeah. into and submerge it. And yeah. it's not like one gallon of water. You're talking about like a bathtub of water. So <laughs> everything's just, you know, magnified literally on an exponential scale. So, but that's one thing that I really, when I started, when I got into the like whole animal cooking, I really embraced the uh, thinking outside the box you know, um, getting out of the commercial stainless steel kitchen, which was, you know, comforting and, you know, secure. But when you're on a farm, when you're on a winery, when you're outside, you kind of have to MacGyver it somewhat because every situation is different. You have to build something to the landscape, to the spec, to the animal. And I really, uh, enjoyed um, thinking outside the box and I welcome that challenge. And then not to mention, you know, I've been so fortunate being in California. I always wish that uh, I had a camera behind me, like following me um, because when you're in the moment, you know, especially when your hands are all messy and greasy, uh, it's kind of hard to, to photograph, but God, the places that I've cooked, up in the you know oh. San Juan Islands, to California, to Tahoe, to Napa Valley. I mean, just amazing. Uh, and the farms there are I amazing. Bet. But, you know, I could enjoy it and say, wow, take a break and look at it and take a mental picture. But, you know, I never had like, you know, and I was always working so hard. I never had, you know, I said I needed like a, somebody filming. That was their job That's because... Yeah, uh, it, you know, document that, but easier yeah. said than done. Uh, so, so let me just uh, um, kind of back up to stuff because I know we jumped ahead quite a few years. We just, so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, um, the whole beast is um, a, a, a company that uh, John founded, and it's um, a restaurant, it was a restaurant, like a startup. He started this uh, company, the whole beast, which is um, nose to tail, meaning you eat, you know, like you eat the whole beast, and um. And also a little bit about sustainability, like you were saying, like, you know, going, getting yeah. far. I, I think I, I briefly mentioned uh, about going to the farm. So um, I kind of got forced into opening up the whole beast uh, um, accidentally. So I just finished, um, basically, uh, I was working uh, at the Cliff House, a mm -hmm. uh, really well-known restaurant, a that's restaurant it. that's been around for over 150 years and beautiful right on the water in San Francisco. And I was there for like three and a half, four years. And I just had uh, uh, my son. And um, uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, becoming a father, uh, you know, er, you know, there's no instruction booklet. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. You know, you got to figure out, you know, but I, um, I needed a little bit more freedom and, um, uh, you know, with daycare and, uh, and, and, and all this stuff and scheduling, I needed like certain days off. And I just, um, it was really, it was difficult on both parties, uh, the restaurant and me kind of, because I just needed a little bit more you know, um, not such a set schedule. I needed like certain days off for like daycare and stuff like that. And my wife was working and, um, so you became an you know, entrepreneur and I was working. Yeah. So actually I had to, uh, you know, I had to leave because, um, it, it was just a struggle. Uh, and I needed a little bit more freedom. And, um, so basically I took a, uh, a break and, and I, uh, the Mr. Mom shift, we said no to the nanny, no to daycare. <laughs> um, it was expensive and it just didn't make sense. You know, who, uh, who's going to watch, you know, your, your, you know, especially at such a young age at five months and six months. So I took a Mr. Mom shift for about a year. And, um, during that time, um, this all farm to table movement was just happening. And um, I'm like, huh, uh, what's this all about? Yeah. And it was like, oh, you know, we're, uh, uh, I was like, well, I was oblivious to it because I kind of grew up uh, in, in that environment. We had a, we had a garden that we lived out of 
like about eight months out of the year. We, um, I grew up in Kansas City for a bit. Um, I'm kind of a Navy brat. I, I was, I, I got to move around a little bit when I was younger, and so we would, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I would go to Kansas City to like the pig farm and, you know, I and and uh, you know the cattle farm, and I would actually see them processed and. We would buy uh, a pig and and and, uh, and divide it with our neighbors, like four neighbors or maybe seven neighbors for a cow. And so, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me as a little kid, I kind of you know uh, experienced that. But this yeah. was a you know a revelation for the majority of of, of, Amer- of Americans. And I was like, yeah, I would have no I, idea I, what I to do kinda, with a pig. <laughs> I, I I took it for granted. And I was like, oh, yeah. I kind of already grew up with this. But I also was looking at it because when I was like at the Cliff House and I was a chef, I would, I'd be one of these annoying people that would ask a lot of questions to like the meat guys. Like, OK, because this is like, you know, what type of animal, what type of breed, where is your farm? Um, and I would ask a couple more questions, but that's as kind of as far as I went. And then when I had, um, you know, time off, uh, which was... Uh, a great time, but I also had a lot of uh, downtime, you know, when the baby's sleeping and I started to explore this and I started seeing like this heritage uh, animal movement where they were, you know, bringing, uh, you know, these kind of old pigs back from, uh, you know, uh, uh, and bringing them into the fold and um, they would, uh, uh, you know, just uh, instead of the commodity pigs, which is, uh, uh I would be, um, so I would reach out to these farms and a lot of them were in my area and I would take a day trip with, uh, my son and we would go to the farm and, um, I would check it out. I was like, oh, this is like, oh, we're growing Berkshire pigs or, you know, uh, a, a Yorkshire pig. And I would go to the farm and I would literally walk in the farmer's footsteps. They would, uh, uh, embraced me because, oh, a chef from San Francisco. So I had a little bit of, you know, street cred. Uh, but I would I would show it by myself when with my son. So I would have my, you know, six, eight, nine month old son with me. And it would, it was, oh, that's so great that you're, you know, exposing them, you know, to where food comes from. So I would completely put them at ease because there was some chefs that would go there, but they would show up with a team of like six or eight people, like all these camera people, and that would freak the farmers out. And <laughs> you, know, you, you put a camera in front of somebody, people get kind of weird. Uh, so <laughs> I would put them really at ease and I was able to kind of talk uh, and, you know, talk to talk with them. And yeah. they, uh, they really embraced me. So, uh, you know, I would, I would, you know, see how they would, you know, r- run their operation and how, uh, um, and, you know, and, and, and how, how clean the, you know, the animals were living and everything, but then they would give me uh, samples of their product. And I was like, uh, you know, I would take it home and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, an evaluation. And I was blown away uh, oh, wow. with, the, with it. I was like, I never got pork like this. I'm like, when, when I was a chef and I'm like, my God, what a, what a huge difference. So, you know, these heritage breeds and when you, you know, you're not mass producing them when you're, you know, growing them in small lots and, you know, they have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, they're not kept up in pens. Uh, you know, they, 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 they get different know, food. They, they get different food, uh, the terroir, but they get to roam around and exercise <laughs> you know, like an old fashioned farm. But I couldn't believe the, the, the difference in flavor. And I'm wow. like, wow. wow. So, uh, you know, um, I kind of was really, uh, you know, uh, moved by this. And then I started checking out another farm and then another farm. And then, you know, uh, I'm in California, but, you know, we have family in like all four corners of the nation. And then I would fly to visit family, you know, and you could fly for, you know, you wouldn't have to pay a a, a ticket for your kid. Um, And I would, uh, you know, and, you know, show off our son Noah and then link up like, oh, there's a farm in this area. And then I'll, you know, I'll go visit a farm. So I really, uh, you know, did this for like a year and a half. And I was so um, 
jazzed on it. I, I you know, I was re-educating myself and uh, I was like, wow, what a difference. And then I would leave such a good impression on the uh, farmers that they was like, oh, I want to make sure that, you know, we get this to John Fink. And then, uh, and then, uh, and I realized that, you know, when you're working with these smaller to medium farms, kind of, you know, buying a rack of ribs or a pork leg, it was really hard for them because uh, they would just grow the animal and then, um, you know, the processor would buy it and then you would buy it from the processor. But if you wanted to buy it from the farm, you really could just couldn't buy like a pork shoulder or a pork leg uh, yeah, cool. or a pork chop. You know, you would have to buy the whole pig. And <laughs> so then I actually had to become, you know, I had to, you know, really become a butcher. So I would process the pig um, and then uh, but I would also be you know, cooking a whole pig and learning how to do that. And as I said, like, uh, you know, cooking a whole animal is a whole different, you know, uh, set of skills. But I kind of brought my kind of life experience, you know, from, you know, from Embry-Riddle to being a Boy <laughs> Scout, to being a commercial fisherman, to being a camper and, a, you know, backpacker and kind of, and a chef and kind of bringing it all these skills and, you um, I was one, you know, as I said, a lot of chefs have cooked a pig, but somehow I developed the, uh, I could kind of nail it, uh, you know, like really cook it right. And uh, that's another uh, skill set. And boy, when you nail a pig, it is something, uh, you know, um, something special. But also <laughs> when you're cooking a pig, it's not just for yourself, you're cooking it. And it's not just for your family of four. You're cooking for like 50, 100, 200 people. So you're getting, you're, you're making a huge impact immediately because they can, you know, they, you know, they're seeing you work, but they get to taste it. And um, so just the feedback I was getting and then other feedbacks, uh, you know, from chefs and. Did it, you know, did like, it take you, know, you, yeah, did it take you a while to nail it or like, did you, um, yeah, there was a, you know, um, I, you know, I had some, I, I actually was inspired by my brother-in-law's father up in Seattle, my wife's, uh, sister's husband, he's Cuban. And, uh, I saw, uh, he would make his guy was named Antonio and he would, uh, do a Cuban pig roast, but, uh, he was a, um, an engineer uh, for General Motors uh, up in uh, up in uh, Flint, Michigan, and uh, you know Cubans love you know roasting pigs, and he basically built a better mass trap because that's what they used to do on special occasions and on the weekends. And he'd have the swing set method of throwing a grill on a you know, on kind of like a swing set and you know uh, coals uh, underneath it, but he built a kind of a uh, a uh, kind of like a fish cooker where you sandwich the pig between two grill grates and then you're able to spin it on like a protractor access and he would build like a cinder block oven and uh, because basically he wanted to solo cook it he didn't want to rely on it, it was like his kids and so he I saw this kind of unfold for about six years but I just loved what he was doing like it was just he had a you know his yeah. wife made him look good by doing all the hard work and uh and prep work but he would just be there shoveling coals and moving around and teasing kids on yeah try the pig skin and and yeah. i would be up with him at six in the morning you know like so you kind of so so you guys yeah, so ideas from that, him but i was like i love what you're doing and then when everybody would show up and then he would be like the you know the magistrate and putting on a show and I was, uh, but he, but he also made it taste really good. Uh, yeah. he was very, and, uh, and so I was inspired by that. Uh, and then, you know, I, 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 I kind of took from him. I learned from him. Uh, we actually made a man fire food episode yeah. uh, up in Napa and he, I, they, they actually wanted, uh, him involved and I got, uh, I got him and his family and they, and they, uh, and they oh. showed up, we cooked at a winery, the terrace and. Yeah, it was great. But so that was on um, uh, yeah, so I, I had a yeah. lot of I had a lot of real world experiences and I kinda it was an opportunity to uh you know to bring this together, not to mention in two thousand eight, 
as I said, like this movement was happening. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I, I just, I just kind of was forced into this and I, you know, I started this, you know, the whole beast. Uh, my wife came up with the name and uh, I didn't want to typecat myself as like, oh, I only cook pigs or I yeah. only cook lambs. I kind of, you know, uh, uh, embraced everything. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of, I, I, you know, I, I, I got started then up in Napa at the wineries. It was kind of, uh, it was only 30 miles away, but it was, a it, that, that, that was a great, uh, uh, setting for me because people would, you know, have these weddings or they yeah. would have like wine release parties and I'd be cooking outdoors. And it was a really, you know, good kind of symbiotic uh, relationship. And then this was something new. I mean, like cooking animals has been around forever, but this was like kind of like a, you know, uh, a new thing, like, cause a lot of people weren't really doing it. And, uh, yeah. you know, I was able to, uh, uh, you know, from San Francisco, but, you know, I know I was working up in Napa and yeah. So that's kind of how the, the whole beast, uh, you know, and then also besides <laughs> cooking the animal, I would be using the vegetables yeah. that were cooked on the farm. So, you know, besides cooking the meat, I would be adding or accenting all these like fresh vegetables, which is a huge difference when you're picking it and cooking it right there. And then the farmers or the vintners would really be jazzed by that. And, uh, and then of course the guests and I really got into it. And then also um, I had a, there was a cooking school, the CIA up there and uh, I was, you know, word yeah. got out and a lot of people wanted to kind of work with me. So uh, and there, yeah, so, uh, it, it was the right place at the right time. And then back, as I said, 2008, 2009, then this whole kind of movement started. So I was kind of ahead of the curve and, you know, kind of, you know, uh, getting it out, uh, you know, uh, in, in, into the mainstream and then, you know, and then chefs were really intrigued and like, Oh, I'd love to help you out. Because as I mentioned before, you know, I got out, I got out of the, kitchen you know the stainless steel kitchen um and you know all of a sudden we're cooking out outside and it was just you know um it was a different, different atmosphere and, and yeah so people and and so chefs were you know like oh god can i help you out i'd love and then <laughs> they were you know uh jazzed <laughs> on that too so it was a really you know uh groundswell i was i was unaware but i and you know and i was all in um uh, to doing it. So, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and then not to mention, you know, as I, I mentioned, I'm like six, five and, you know, but I was very physical and strong, you know, and lifting up a, you know, pig over my shoulder and moving it around and people kind of really, you know, wow, that's awesome. You know, and stuff like that. So, so, yeah. So speaking of pig, I know Jamie later, late Jamers has a uh, question about, uh, what is your favorite part of the pig to make a meal from? Do you have <laughs> that's a loaded question <laughs> uh the, um you know i um <laughs> I, you know i it, to be perfectly honest i love the pig head so uh uh, that's like the jowls, the guanciale they make uh, meat from, but also the pork cheeks. Um, I love the neck. I think the neck of almost any animal is exquisite because that's a very well used, uh, you know, muscle because they're always, you know, foraging and moving up and down. So the copa, which is actually, you know, the, 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 the pork neck, I find that and, and that's more readily available kind of like a pig head, you kind of have to know a farmer or a processor to get that. And then, yeah, you know, uh, that, 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 that's a whole nother thing. Uh, you know, you got to kind of cut it in half or you need a big oven or something like that. Um, but uh, I would say the pork neck. So the, 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 the Copa and that's not, and, and it's, and, and that's a real interesting piece because you can cook it fast where you cook it like mid rare um and you cook it like a steak or you could kind of slow braise it or smoke it and it's you know it has a lot of collagen and that really you know kind of 
lends itself to sort of melt in your mouth, uh, really soft. And, uh, but it's, uh, uh, you know, like, um, so like on a pork chop, you kind of got, you know, you have that, it's kind of like a lighter color of meat, kind of yeah. whitish. Mm -hmm. And then, but that pork neck, uh, you know, is up towards the, you know, the head and the shoulder and that's a really well used. So it's a redder, uh, you know, uh, color of meat. Interesting. Uh, and, and it depends on the, on the breed too. It can get like, you know, almost beef like red. Uh, but that is a really well used, uh, you know, part of the animal and, you know, it can be tough. You can cook it wrong and it's like chewy bubble gum and not, not the greatest, uh, kind of like how my octopus, know what you do, if like you know what you're doing, tomorrow. you can do it, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's wonderful. So I'm getting ideas for my fun food Friday streams where we cook on our channel sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> or eat mm -hmm. or eat fun food. Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all want to see me eat a pig head, but <laughs> well, well, ironically, you know, like when I say uh, a pig head, you know, that's actually quite inexpensive uh, because that is not the highly desirable part, but uh, there is a lot of meat on it. There's a lot of fat, there's a lot of skin, but there's some, you know, like the meat, especially like the pork cheeks, that is probably one of the most well-used muscle on the pig. Cause they're always, you know, eating and foraging. <laughs> and so you have this really, yeah. you know, collagen -y, uh, and you know, it, you know, when you braise it or, you know, cook it really properly or smoke it, it is exquisite. Uh, and you know the jowls are really fatty, and they're kind of striations of of uh, meat fibers in there, and that's a, a great item to either slow cook or smoke or cure. And you know, that's sure. like that Italian sure. bacon. Uh, so, yeah. So um, yeah, no, that's interesting. So, so, so that's so, why you so, got here. So, so, yeah, and and what the whole beast? How a what, what I what I was amazed with was. Um, you know, you know about it, but when you don't, but when you actually have a pig and you're like, wow, this is like 300 pounds. What do I do with it all? Um, and then you realize all these parts and then you kind of appreciate like uh, the curing factor. So like making bacon, making prosciutto, making uh, pancetta, making um, uh, salami, making s sausages, yeah. You kind of really appreciate because you have all this, you know, protein to work with. And as a family, even a large family, you can only eat so much. So uh, you really appreciate like the whole old world style of curing because you can, you know, put this aside, salt it, you know, cure it, uh, you know, um, air dry it, smoke it. And you can use this six months eight two years down the line and so it's a great way to kind of uh preserve it and also yeah before refrigeration so you really you really appreciate uh um because as i said in a restaurant setting you know you order meat from the the meat purveyor and it comes in a box or a cryovac bag and you get a specific cut and you don't even get like a primal cut. You get like the tenderloin or like the pork loin or the pork chop or, you know, some people get like a pork leg or a pork shoulder. But when you see it in the whole thing, you know, there's like two pork shoulders, there's four legs, there's, you know, uh, four hocks and, you know, there's two loins and two tenderloins and there's a lot of, you know, and then certain parts of the shoulder are different from like the whole shoulder and. Uh, yeah, you yeah. really get to appreciate like, wow. Uh -huh. So we have another question from KJ, um, for RMZ. He said, chef, how do we boost the whole animal butchery movement and bring back the local butcher shop? Well, thankfully, uh, this has been a process and I'm really proud of, you know, helping this along and the local butcher shops are really getting, uh, a lot of, um, play or they're getting noticed and a lot more butcher shops uh are opening up uh and they're being you know run by uh you know some young butchers uh, uh or chefs and um 
and they're actually, you know, um, uh, small, so they're not huge, like, you know, like a big, gro- you know, grocery store chain, like, you know, Safeway or, or uh, a, a, a large, or a large place like that. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit more expensive. Uh, but, you know, in the meat industry, uh, if you want to save it, uh, eat less meat. And, you know, it's, it kind of goes against the American way. But, uh, um, you know, w- w- with these breeds that they're really bringing back, uh, they just take a lot longer to um, uh, grow or to raise. Um, and the feed's different and it's more expensive. And they're not, you know, being, you know, raised in, you know, small confinement pens and stuff. So they, they have a lot more land. And uh, it's uh, so it's just, you know, everything costs more. So, um, uh, so like, you know, uh, for example, uh, especially, uh, st- uh, steak beef, uh, has, it's amazing how much it's, uh, uh, gotten more expensive, but, um, you know, there's a difference between a five ninety nine New York steak and a twenty nine ninety nine steak and uh from your local butcher uh compared to i don't want to single any you know large <laughs> box stores. store out but yeah but uh you know there's a huge difference and yeah you, know, you don't need like a 16 ounce new york steak maybe a five ounce or a four ounce is all you need because it's fattier and when i say fattier not just the fat cup but the intermuscular fat so the marbling and so it has a really good mouth feel but you know, the taste is so much better. And then all, you know, you don't need like 16 ounces of, uh, 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 you know, uh, a, a big steak, you know, which is that classic kind of Americano thing, you know, uh, and a huge baked potato, you know, maybe like a four ounce, like a really way, you know, raised cow, a, a, a grass fed or, you know, a Wagyu or a uh, certified Angus. Uh, and it's, it's, it's such a difference. And you realize, uh, you know, less is more and you don't need, you know, like four ounces, three ounces. I mean, like the Japanese, you know, with their Wagyu and Kobe, you know, they're they're eating it like almost like sushi where you're getting you're eating like a half ounce. I mean, it's so rich and fatty, but that's all you need, like one ounce maximum. And that's it, you know. And yeah. so, you know, instead of like the classic American where I need my, you know, steak still mooing and you know it's a huge piece and um yeah so i know yeah i I was uh gonna say so you know talking about butcher we we were talking about like the local butcher and how it sounded like you trained yourself trained yourself to become a butcher you also mentioned that you were on um was it team usa butchers of america competing for the title of uh world's best butcher and you said you tried yeah so that's it interesting because that's actually a problem we have uh, in America. Because I was taught butchery in cooking school, but we weren't doing a whole pig uh, or a whole animal. And um, I had to, uh, uh, you know, so I had an idea, but I really learned on my own. Like I learned when I bought my own pig, I bought a, uh, uh, Mangalitas pig. I was one of like the first California chefs and a uh, uh, very expensive Hungarian. Uh, it's a very uh, fatty uh, pig, but I, I bought it for like $900. And that's a different, when you're paying your own money, especially it was like six bucks a pound and uh, six fifty a pound, I think. And this was God back in 2000. 11 or something Mm -hmm. and uh um you know instead of the restaurant where they're picking up the tab you know all you have to do is sign for it but i had my you know i paid it for my own money i wasn't you know uh i i I didn't have you know i I wasn't like crazy uh well wealthy uh especially starting out a business at that point but you know there's a, a real kind of sense of urgency and you better learn and uh Right. You know, and I, and I, you know, it's like, well, I kind of had an idea, you know, and you look at books and guides, but you don't know till you actually get in there. 
but you know, spending my own money, there was like a real sense, like I better not, I better not screw this up because this yeah. is a lot of money because, you know, quite frankly, if I had to do it over again, I think I would have bought a commodity pig much cheaper and tried to teach myself on that. But I had oh, to, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, Oh, I had to get this high end pig, but you know, it made me really take it very seriously. And, uh, you know, I don't want to mess this up and I don't want to waste anything because God, this is a lot of money. And, and then, you know, besides the money, but also, you know, I knew about this, you know, the history of the pig and where it grew up and what it was foraging on. And I was like one of the, you know, yeah. like, I, you know, I was like one of the, you know, Thomas Keller from the French Laundry was buying pigs from this guy and then me. Uh, so, you know, we were really, you know, on that, you know, there was an article in the New York Times and that's what piqued my interest. And uh, yeah, so. Um, but, but, you know, as I said, when I paid my own money, it really, you know, um, sink or swim, you better, you know, like, so, and then, you know, it's like, oh, I get it. And then you start hanging out with other butchers, like, oh, I see what I'm doing. And then, you know, cooking whole animals, I was kind of going into reverse where, you know, I would be butchering a cooked animal. Like I would, you know, I wouldn't butcher a, a, a you know, a live, an I mean, not a live animal, but, you know a, uh, raw. you know, uh, yeah. be a raw before you do it. I would, you know, process it or, you know, carve it when it's cooked, which is a whole different feat too. It's actually easier, right? To, probably. you know, a, a, you know, and a raw state, but, um, yeah, so I kind of, it, it was kind of weird, uh, you know, how I kind of came about, but, um, you know, I really learned about the anatomy and then, uh, cooking for these, you know, uh, wineries and at weddings. And then all of a sudden I started to get into these kind of large scale events, like outside lands and eat real festival and sunset magazine and, you know, thousands, thousands of people. So I would be cooking like, like at outside lands, we cook 45 lamb uh, in a three day period. So, you know, uh, you get one under your belt and all of a sudden you get, you know, you got like, you know, after the weekend, you got, it's like, damn, I just cooked 45 lamb. And so, which yeah. when you step that back, it's like, you know, and you're in the moment, you're not thinking of it because you're, you're, you're working like a banshee, but you're like, holy moly, that's a, that's a pretty incredible feat. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I kind of, you know, and then you're just exposed to it, um, uh, you know, where, you, you, where, you, you, you just picked it up, you know, where do you, you learn how to do Like you, you said you got a pig, like, do you take it to your garage or your kitchen or do you have a friend? Like you take it to a butcher shop and say like, I need your table. Like, where did you, where did you go? <laughs> or what story do you want to hear now? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just story. wondering. Like, uh, No, I'll be very candid. Um, so when I bought that first pig, I, I butchered it in the winter time. I butchered it. Um, I had a whole pig and I did it in my garage and I took like, I, I, I turned this huge table and I turned it into a butcher table and, you know, I set up my lights and I was like, oh yeah, this will take me like four or five hours. And I'm like up for like 19 hours butchering this pig. I know, you know I'm not the, I wasn't the only one night. thinking. Uh, but you know, I was like, I had to, uh, you know, I had to, I had to get it done. So I learned in my garage and then I realized there's got to be a better way and, yeah. you know, at a commercial kitchen yeah. or I would, you know, go back to a restaurant where I worked at and, and use theirs. Cause you need a walk-in, you know, nothing, no, no animal <laughs> fits into a normal fridge. And yeah, you know, no, that's what I was fridge, thinking. I'm like, like what do you do? Where like, do you go? Like, like just putting a pig head does not fit into a refrigerator, let alone a, you know, a 40 pound shoulder or, you know, a four foot loin or something like that. So yeah. you realize I needed a commercial kitchen to just to hold the pig or hold the pig parts and, um, and all that stuff. So, yeah, I kind of learned, uh, in my, you know, I kind of cleaned out my garage and set it up and, uh, what was your you wife know, thinking? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Thank, we're still married, believe it or not. Uh, there's a pig in my garage. She was, she was with me. She was holding the lamp, the light. Oh, you know, okay. It's like <laughs> at like one in the morning, and I'm like, "You should go to bed." I'm like, "No, no, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. I'm, I'm right in the middle of it. I can't stop." And yeah, no, she. Uh, oh, that's. And good. ironically, she was working at the SPCA. Oh. Uh, yeah. So she was, you know. 
um, <laughs> it rescuing. Opposites attract. She was like rock uh, rescuing. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> she's been a great, uh, uh, supporter of mine. So, uh, yeah, but we, she, uh, yeah. So we have another, another question from Brian. Oh, I think Garrett just, well, yeah. oh, and then Becca the, has another the, question. Uh, the, 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 the proper knife grip. Well, it depends, you know, uh, a cook, a chef, um, a food prep person, you know, they hold the knife kind of, uh, you know, forward uh, in a, uh, uh, like the, the classic shape, but a butcher does it both because sometimes you need to slice and you, you kind of, uh, but then sometimes you need the pistol grip where, you know, uh, where the point usually uh, is coming out from your thumb uh, or index finger, where the pistol grip is the complete opposite, where the blade is actually coming out from your, uh, your pinky. And it's more, you know, kind of like that stabbing motion, but you actually have a lot more control, a lot more uh, power, more muscle. So when you're, uh, you're kind of cutting through the sinew or going against the bone, uh, you actually, it, it seems counterintuitive, but you have a lot better control. And then not to mention, uh, there's a fatigue uh, thing because all of a sudden you can get the, this kind of grip uh, from holding it like a normal like cook or chef or prep cook. Uh, and when you're holding, you know, when you're butchering animals for a living or, you know, an eight hour shift, your hand and your muscles get fatigued. So this is a lot more you know, uh, you have a lot more longevity. So you just, you know, you're not cramping. Like this, up. you're holding exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's like, but you have a lot more um, uh, control uh, to say the least. So. And then um, Becca wants to know which, uh, which has the best marbling, the American Wagyu or the Japanese? Well, that's uh, another, you know, kind of loaded question. So there, <laughs> they, so, you know, the Wagyu is, is, is basically Japanese, but when it came to America, it's bred with the black Angus uh, cow, which is uh, uh, a very well-known black Angus beef. So, um, and there's nothing wrong. Uh, you know, you kind of get the best of both worlds where the, you know, the Japanese Wagyu, AKA Kobe, uh, it's very, you know, fatty, intermuscular, marbled. Uh, but you, you also, um, uh, um, it's not as meaty. Where like the Black Angus cow, you get this like, uh, you know, like a solid piece of meat. And what the beauty about the Wagyu is you get this great, you know, marbling. And so you have a lot of genetics uh, that has something to do with it. But it's also really in how the cattle is raised and how it's fed, how it's finished, um, and the terroir, the area that it grows. You know, is it in a northern climate or a southern climate? Some breeds do better, like in Southern California, than the than the breeds do better up in you know Washington or uh, Wyoming or, or, or something like that. So, uh, there's a lot, you know, it's just not like, oh, it's Wagyu or, oh, it's Kobe. Uh, but the American Wagyu that we get is, 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 um, is a, is a cross between black Angus and the genetics of a, uh, a Wagyu. And, um, uh, but not all Wagyu's are the same. As I said, it, it yeah. depends how they're grown, where they're grown, because, you can get some Wagyu's that almost look like, you know, Kobe beef where it's like, it's almost snowy. It's so, there's so much fat and inner muscular fat. And then you get some Wagyu's that are, that are quite lean and just a little bit of marbling. Uh, and it just depends on how they're raised and finished and all this stuff. So. It looks like uh, uh, Mike has a question and happy birthday, Mike. <laughs> um, happy birthday. For chef, have you been, have you done anything with bison meat? Yes. Uh, and I really want to explore the whole uh, bison um, uh, world. I, I actually had an opportunity to butcher a bison up in Portland. I was doing a wedding and uh, they wanted uh, some elk and uh, this meat purveyor uh, was able to source some for me. And when I went into their pick it up, they had four American bisons hanging and they were in the process of butchering it. And I'm like, can I help out? And uh, 
Yeah, they let me butcher one of them. And it's very much like a cow or a steer, bigger, uh, a different rib kind of, you know, rounder, you know, rib cage, but, but, but quite similar. And, uh, but, you know, the bones are much uh, denser and bigger and, you know, stronger. Uh, But um, bison is a great one because that's so Americano. That's the, you know, the, 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 the North American and they used to roam, you know, everywhere. There's a lot of meat on them. Uh, you know, but they're uh, uh, a working, uh, well, a, a, a running animal. So they don't have a lot of fat on them oh, and okay. they don't have a lot of intermuscular fat. So when you are cooking them, uh, you uh, like uh, uh, you want to cook it rare uh, because if you cook it like mid- medium, mid well, well done, it's very dry uh, and not that great. So you really want to cook oh. it like in that rare to mid rare uh a very popular item, uh, burgers, the grind, and you definitely want to, uh, uh, you know, cook that rare to mid rare and it's very juicy, but it's a very rich, uh, tasting meat. People love it. It has a great, uh, um, uh, flavor. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, that is a meat for the future because it's such a, it's literally 30 to 40% larger than a, uh, a cattle. Uh, and, um, but there's a lot of health benefits because it's it's a lot less fatty. Uh, and, you know, when you're, you know, back in the in the day, like the 16, 17, 1800s, you know, you're not cooking, uh, you know, when, when they would process, you know, you, you're, you're not cooking that animal uh, well done. You're cooking it, you know, you're 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 on the uh, on the trail and you're cooking it quick and. So you have a, 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 you know, you're not, uh, you know, cooking it all day or something like that. So, uh, but it, it, it's, it's great. And I think uh, I, I'm glad it's been a tough sale, but it's starting to get a little bit more prominence. I think the bison burger has been really popular and uh, thank goodness for that. Cause you know, Americans love burgers and so does a lot of other countries. And I think that's a great application for it. And there's a lot of, health, uh, you know, uh, uh, pluses to it. So bison is, is, is a great one. So I think all the game meats like venison is incredibly lean, but incredibly, you know, flavorful, but it's not, you know, it's not like that classic, you know, American, you know, cow, uh, where it's fatty. And, uh, so you gotta, you have to know how to cook it, but you know, the meat itself is, is quite delicious. And then, as I said, deer like venison, but then elk and caribou. I mean, it's even, you know, tastier. Uh, So. So I know um, there's a couple some more questions. Jamie um, has, what's the difference between the marbling? We were just talking a little bit about fat marbling and fat in the meat. Like I, that's a good question because I don't know. I know. So fat takes on a, 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 a a top, a couple different uh, uh, definitions on the animal. You have a lot of hard fat, you have soft fat and then you have intermuscular fat. So the hard fat is kind of like on the outside. Uh, so for example, like a ribeye cap, you know, you have that fat cap or in New York um, and that's kind of like a hard fat. Uh, and then you have a soft fat and that is the fat that's kind of around the shoulder inside to the kidney uh, fat. There's a, uh, um, uh, that surrounds the kidney and around the uh, uh, the fillet, and that's a uh, you know a, a softer fat that you know melts real easily, um, and you can use it for uh, cooking uh, and 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 like pie doughs and stuff like that, and and the confit. Where the harder fat uh, is, you know, you would use that. Uh, for basting, you render it down where you have like the tallow, we're talking about beef or, you know, uh, lard on, on a pig. Uh, but, um, and you would also use that harder fat for like sausage making. So like for beef sausages, because it doesn't melt so quickly, but, uh, you know, releases its, its juices, it's, you know, uh, uh, the fat and, um, it, it gives it that great mouthfeel and the juiciness, 
And then you have the intermuscular fat, which is in the, in, in the you know, it's kind of interspersed between the, mu the muscle mean. fibers where, you know, you have like a ribeye or a New York and you have those little striations of fat in the meat and that melts into the meat. And that actually kind of, you know, makes it juicy, lubricates the meat. Uh, um, and, you know, so when it comes up to temperature, like, you know, properly like 125 uh, 130, you know, that, that, that fat, you know, starts to melt away and then yeah. it gives you that great mouth feel. So, yeah. yeah, but fat, there's like three different, you know, kind of connotations of, of the fat. So. so I know, um, <clears throat> I know we wanted to talk a little bit about Easter coming up and some foods that people like to eat, like lamb. You just talked about how you cooked like a bunch of lambs at all in a, a couple days. Um, so is, are there any, you know, favorite foods that you like so ironically um you know like with the whole beast like everybody says so how many pigs have you cooked or how many cows have you cooked and uh um ironically uh i don't have you know like to cook a to cook a cow is a serious uh endeavor i mean you know you need a special contraption but you oh i lost you oh we're here oh sorry we can see you. <laughs> we can still see you. Um, so yeah, so he's uh, he's got. Are, Sorry about that. Can you see us? I thought I, thought I turned all my phones off. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so I cook more lamb uh, as an animal uh, than anything else, like well over eight hundred. But uh, turkeys. Um, I've cooked a lot uh, and like 6,000 turkeys uh, I have underneath my belt. And uh, so, you know, and, and cows, I probably cooked about for eight, Easter. Uh, oh, pigs. Uh, oh. Yeah. No, no, no. So you, so, but I, I so we're talking about lamb. So, um, I, you know, ironically, I've, uh, I, I got really good at cooking lamb. So, we're talking about Easter. One of my favorite Easter items, uh, and I think it's a lot of Americans, uh, is a leg of lamb uh, for Easter. And I think that's a great, you can kind of pick that up anywhere. They have, uh, now it's springtime. Spring happened last week. So you have these spring lambs. So you get, you know, they're, they're feeding off the uh, fresh, you know, uh, spring grasses. Everything's green. So it really affects their flavor. It's a lot more milder, but they get, you know, some really special fats at, at, at that time of the year. So the you know, spring lamb is, uh, is, uh, unique and something special. It's actually a little bit more milder sometimes, uh, throughout the year, like lamb kind of gets a bad rap because it's gamey, has a, has a stronger, uh, yeah. flavor. And so, uh, during the springtime, so like now you're buying, uh, for Easter, we're two weeks into spring, um, a leg of lamb and, uh, you know, you can cook the leg with the bone in or boneless, and then you can uh, uh, stuff it, uh, you know, with, um, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, with feta and roasted garlic and pine nuts and sun-dried tomatoes. Stuffing, or, you're or, stuffing or, the leg or you're stuffing the lamb? You're stuffing the, the, the leg, the leg. Yeah, we're, 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 we're yeah, we're talking, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. We're talking about a leg of lamb for Easter. Yeah. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so you can have, you know, so a leg of lamb, you have the leg bone, the femur, uh, uh -huh. and you can cook it that way, which, uh, is, is, I actually prefer it because you, you actually get a lot of, uh, flavor from the bone, but it also protects the meat. So you, you know, you're, you're prone not to overcook it, but then a lot of people like to, uh, you know, serve a, a leg of lamb as a roast, you know, as a centerpiece. And instead of carving it around the bone, you know, you don't have a bone, it's boneless and, uh, you know, you can cook it that way. And some people get inventive by stuffing it uh, or season it aggressively. Okay. And uh, so there's, you know, some people do it the Greek way where you, you know, you, you, you put uh, garlic or roasted garlic and feta cheese and pine nuts and uh, olives or sun-dried tomatoes. And then you just kind of roll it up and tie it. And that's a nice way uh, to cook it. Or you can just go uh, herb. You cook Rosemary. it in the oven, like you bake it. Cook it in the oven, yeah. Okay. You just roast it, yeah. Uh -huh. And it depends okay. on the size of the meat. Leg of lamb is kind of between like six to 
13 pounds debone, you're probably, it's probably a little bit more, uh, you're, you're talking about maybe a seven to nine pound roast, which is you, perfect for a, uh, you know, a family setting. Do you cook it like a turkey? Like you like in your roasting pan? Is that kind of you... like, a, yeah, yeah, exactly. In a roasting okay. pan. So, mm -hmm. okay. And so... what I really, uh, I like lamb one has a lot more flavor, but it can take a lot of aggressive seasoning and not just salt and pepper, but like spices, chilies, uh, you know, like a curry powder or, you know, these, uh, uh, I, I, I like seasoning lamb with a lot of like Northern African spices, uh, a Burberry or a, oh, wow. okay. um, a, um, a harissa or like a tremola. And, um, these are, you know, uh, or, or, or the classic, uh, you know, cumin and coriander and black pepper. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it, 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 it lends itself to a lot of uh, spice and it, it really um, excels, sings. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I see D Jonathan has a question about the, back to the, the other, the meat. <laughs> He's wanting to know about the, uh, what was it, the Australian? He's seeing more Australian. Yeah, so uh, Australia is doing a great job with their uh, um, meat farming, uh, and they have uh, they they have been growing wagyu, and it's the same thing. Uh, it's a uh, uh, it, it's a cross between you know th their their cattle. I'm not sure if it's Black Angus, uh, but um, it's um, it depends. Sometimes it could be a little little less expensive than the uh, American wagyu. But it, it, it's excellent. And, and in Australia and New Zealand, especially in the lamb department, you know, like in New Zealand, there's more lamb than, than, than people uh, they are growing there. And, uh, but the uh, all, all Australians love their beef and, uh, and they're doing a, a, a magnificent. And I have bought uh, Australian Wagyu and it is, it is lovely. But it also, it depends, you know, uh, the farm and the purveyor you're buying it from. And, uh, unfortunately I have never visited, uh, Australia to see exactly, uh, what, what, uh, uh, of how they're doing it, but they're doing, I have a lot of friends over there. In fact, you mentioned, uh, that, uh, butchery competition, uh, I was on team USA and it was run by, uh, uh, Australia, these, uh, guys from Australia and New Zealand. And one of the guys is actually the ambassador, uh, the, the chairman for the, uh, New Zealand beef and, and lamb board. So, uh, oh. yeah, but, uh, so, uh, so we have another question. Don't be, uh, so oh. don't think that, Oh, I have to, you know, uh, you know, I got to buy American, uh, there's nothing, you know, Australia's doing a, uh, an amazing exactly. job. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the Japanese, they're just starting to offer it here in the States as of like a year and a half ago, two years. It's pricey. Uh, and I mean, like it can it can fetch, you know, well over $100 a pound to upwards of $500. Uh, but that's when oh. you're, yeah, it's, it's kind of <laughs> crazy. Uh, but that's when you're, you know, having a little bit like one ounce or, or two ounce. And it's a super special occasion. Uh, so there's really very few. I, I actually think you know. I think I think the uh, the the Kobe or the the Japanese wagyu is made in, in the Costco uh, of uh, uh, talk about an American thing. Yeah, but it's expensive. It's not cheap. I think it's like you know. You can buy it at Costco. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've heard. I haven't. Huh? I haven't seen it myself. But it's like yeah. I just got this. You know, huh. It's about three hundred dollars on like you know two and a half pounds. I'm like ooh. Wow. Uh, so, so. Um, yeah, so Adventures by D, Dave or Chris, I wanted to know for the chef, thoughts on deep frying a turkey. Is that one of your preferred cooking methods? Mm. Um, it's not as easy uh, as you uh, anticipate. And that is another, you know, classic uh, example of you got to have the gear. And so you can buy these like turkey fryers from like, you know, Home Depot, but they're really small uh you know when you have the turkey and the oil and everything seems to kind of spill over so you really want to buy like a you know uh a large stock pot and uh when i mean large like kind of like an army size or even larger okay. you know like a 15 gallon uh <laughs> you know uh, thing 
and you know you want to fry it in a good amount of oil not like a little bit uh uh you know kind of like 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 five gallons of oil that's why i said like a 15 gallon pot and then yeah. when you uh you know you drop the whatever uh 16 18 22 pound bird uh you know you have that kind of displacement when it's hot and, you know it and have your fire extinguisher ready <laughs> do it outside uh yes. do it on the lawn or gravel or your you know your your driveway well not your driveway you leave a stain but um yeah you want to do it outside and have your fire extinguisher don't have a hose you want a fire extinguisher uh but um it's something wonderful i mean people love fried chicken and um you know uh, uh and so when you nail it like a fried turkey it, it's uh, unbelievable but I've never heard it's that. also kind of difficult because it takes a little bit longer. It can take like 35 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes. So it's kind of, you know, it depends on the size of the bird and how hot you keep your oil. And, um, you know, you can't really check the bird halfway through cooking, you oh, know, wow. uh, you know, cause then you, you, you know, you're, you're kind of breaking it apart and then you're, you know, putting it back into the oil and, you know, you're not cooking the outside of the bird. It kind of gets in. It's, it's, so uh, you really got to, you know, um, have a couple uh, uh, under your belt to do it. But it, it, it's a great way to do it. But it's not as easy. Uh, and I don't recommend buying like uh, one of those turkey fryers from Home, Home Depot because they're just not big enough. And oh, they just okay. cause all sorts of problems. You really want to go to like a restaurant and get a stock pot, like 15 gallons. And then okay. you're not going to have that boil over and... Uh, and all this mess and a, and a nightmare uh, potential scenario happening. Uh, I know so. Stacy. Stacy has a question. Um, she said, "As the daughter of a butcher, I can't see the whole question there. Uh, as the daughter of a butcher, I'd like to know what the thoughts of a chef on people eating raw hamburger." <laughs> so Is that there's a thing? nothing wrong with that, but you know, um, I would not eat raw hamburger from a grocery store uh maybe from a good butcher smaller butcher where they grind their meats every day and get there in the morning and, and get that or quite frankly you know grind it yourself or chop it up yourself and do it that way uh and you can do it and um you know quite frankly you kind of you know when a lot of people don't have this uh luxury of like, uh, you know, when you process, when you, when you kill an animal, you can eat it raw, no problem. But then once it sits and ages, uh, things can kind of happen. And, you know, so like, you know, the classic French tartare, uh, steak tartare, um, sorry, not French tartare, uh, steak tartare, but that's like mixed with mustard and olive oil and like, you know, capers and, uh, Gherkin. So they have all this acid and that kind of cleans it and kind of sanitizes the meat. Um, uh, and so that's fine. But I would not, um, for example, go to like a local, uh, like a big, big grocery store and, and be eaten raw because that yeah. stuff's grinded like a week to two weeks ahead of time. And that's, you know, that's when you want to cook your, your ground meat like you know mid well well done uh, yeah just... stacy i didn't i didn't even know that that was a thing stacy no no thing, steak like... tartare, that oh, and my, then, uh, yeah it, it's actually quite lovely you know you're okay. not eating like a, a six ounce pete you're only eating a little bit but um uh it, it, it's quite lovely but uh um kim's in the chat kim's in the chat she says she loves fried, fried turkey <laughs> stuff like that and that ass did kind of kind of cleans it up and cooks it and sanitizes it and kills a lot oh. of, you know, uh, things that could like bacteria and stuff like that. Oh, okay. but, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so Kim, yeah. Kim's uh, in the chat. She said she loves fried Turkey. Yeah. <laughs> if it's done right, it's magnificent. Uh, uh, but, uh, sometimes it's, uh, you know, underdone or overdone and you just want to, you know, like fried chicken. Who doesn't like fried chicken? And when it's done really well, you're like, ah, now I understand the whole hype behind this. So, yeah. uh -huh. and you know, uh, quite frankly, uh, and a, a no to uh, cooking a whole turkey, 
you know, it's actually a great way to do it uh, for Thanksgiving when you're having your family over, especially when you've have a couple, uh, you know, you've done them a couple times. I wouldn't want to, you know, kind of do it the first time under pressure with the whole family there. But it frees up a whole lot of space in the kitchen, the oven, so you can cook a lot of side things. But also the time factor, instead of cooking a bird for like two and a half to four hours, so it kind of takes up a lot of space and time in the, you know, most home kitchens, you have one oven, uh, you know, you're cooking outside, you're cooking on a completely different heat source. So you're freeing up the, uh, the, the kitchen to, you know, for baking or, you know, doing your, what have you, mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes and Brussels sprouts and stuffing and all this other stuff. So it's actually a great way, uh, to uh, free up the kitchen and um, but not to mention you can cook a turkey in like an hour and and so that kind of shortens you know your whole day in the kitchen or yeah uh, it gives your uh, can, your can, significant can, other yeah. uh, uh, a little bit more freedom and they're not up at six in the morning you know and all this stuff um, yeah yeah so by the way hi Kim thanks for joining us. And um, all the other people who joined in the chat late, um, welcome in. I'm sorry, I, I didn't say hi earlier. Um, and so Kim said they're good at it because the very first time it looked like a shrunken head when she, uh, I guess when she deep fried her turkey, which is funny because mm -hmm. I cooked my turkey this Thanksgiving. Everybody knows, um, I don't know, were they watching in the chat? I can't remember. Did we do that live when I cooked the turkey? No, I don't think I did it live. Um, we cooked it and I kept cooking it and I kept cooking it and I'm like, it's not done. And I was using a meat thermometer and I'm like, it's not done. It's not done. And then, um, after like five or six hours in the oven, like I said, it really looks like it's done. It's getting burnt. Why is it like not the right temperature? And it was user error with the meat thermometer. <laughs> oh, and that a very, that's very a, cooked turkey. That's a common thing. And, uh, <laughs> and, and also with the, uh, with the American birds, you know, they always say, oh, you know, test it at the thigh, you yeah. know, at, at that egg thigh kind of thick point. You actually want to, you know, take the temperature at the breast at, at that where that thick part of the breast is. Uh -oh. where the wing, and because that's the densest part, that's the thickest breast. part. Because uh, especially okay. when you're deep frying a turkey, sometimes uh, um, and, 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 and even even oven roasting a turkey, uh you know, sometimes that leg thigh meat is a lot less uh, thick than that, you know, especially when you're talking a tom turkey, when you're getting it into the 20 pound category uh, of a turkey, those breasts are quite, quite, quite big and large and they, uh, they're, they're quite dense and uh, yeah. yeah, you really, uh, well, you that's a good temperature. That's, that's a good tip. So, so. Uh, but, but my tip on turkeys is I think 16 to 18 pounds is the sweet spot for a, uh, cooking a raw turkey. 16 to 18? I, yeah, I find that, I think the 12 pounds are a little too small. And I think anything 22 pounds, 20, 20, you know, 28, 32 pounds, they're, the breasts are, it's too big. And it, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, but I, I find that it's like a young turkey is like that teenager, uh, it's like 16, 18. And it's just, it's just like, you know, like the, the, the breast is the right size and the, and the leg meat is like, you know, developed. And I think that's like, uh, you know, and it's, you know, uh, that's good because too. those, because those, those 10 pound turkeys, 10, 12 pounds, they're a little too skinny and, um, oh, okay. that's not, not a good meaty. turkey if it's skinny. No, no. And you, you know, with the turkey, the great things is leftovers. Everybody likes to make like, you know, soup or sandwiches or, or, you know, chili or enchiladas or something, you know, so. So, uh, um, I know I have, I have a couple of questions and I know maybe the chat has more questions. They've been putting them on. So I, I want to ask you a couple of the questions that I had and then, um, and leave, leave time for you to talk a little bit about your blended sausages, if that sounds okay. So. Mm, okay. That? okay. So yeah. um, I know. So one of the questions and maybe some people um, want to know is um, who have you cooked for any famous people or any famous people you've cooked with, like any um, famous chefs or any. Well, it sounds like you yeah, get a lot so of. Big... I, I, I've been so fortunate, especially in San Francisco. I have uh, rubbed elbows with so many great uh, 
cooks that become well-known chefs to chefs that kind of, you know, took me in, uh, took pity and hired me uh, and, and let me into their kitchen, you know, run around. Uh, um, so Michael Mina, uh, he he's made a good name for himself, has quite a few restaurants around around the world, especially around the United States. And uh, that was my first job in San Francisco was at Aqua. And he was just the chef de cuisine at that time and uh, a well-known restaurant in, in San Francisco. Just got four stars uh, just before I got there. So they got, you know, all of a sudden they, you know, they were on the map and everybody wanted to go there. So I got really, I thought I knew something coming from Arizona. <laughs> and uh, I realized, um, I'm in the, I'm in a different category and a different league. And, uh, uh, I, I learned, uh, I learned a lot there at, at Aqua. And, uh, um, yeah. so yeah. And then, uh, I worked with, um, Wolfgang Puck. I worked at his restaurant, uh, post trio, and I was actually super fortunate. Uh, uh, I left, I, I, I went from Aqua to post trio and, um, you know, I had a great opportunity. I worked with like four chefs there. The gin grasses were there when I first got there. Then the Rosenthal's came in. But Wolfgang was always, you know, uh, coming in. That was like kind of his uh, Spago and Post Trio were his flagship. And yeah, Post Trio was really starting to get known. But what was really great about Post Trio was the cooks. Uh, we were, you know, we're, we're all chefs these days. But I was one of many but i was surrounded by so many uh amazing cooks and um and then they gave me a great opportunity because i was working at aqua four star res i was all proud of myself and then you know uh, i went to post trio and uh they gave me a job in the pizza kitchen i'm like but you know hey, uh, <laughs> I worked at Aqua. I shouldn't be like on the grill like the like they're like no we uh you know we have a job in the pizza kitchen and yeah. uh I'm like, but I should be, you know, and it's like, we want a job. And I, I you know, uh, so I, I worked in the pizza kitchen, which, you know, Wolfgang is famous. He's made, built an empire on his pizzas. But, you know, I got to work there and learn how to make, you know, like the, the California pizza. And I take that to, you know, to this day and how pizza is so popular now and everybody's yeah. opened up a pizza joint. The but the fire, opportunity the that, that post trio was a moment in time. It was really hot uh and up and you know at, at, at the restaurant at that time but i got i got uh i i, I was like a chef turnod so i got to work all these different facets of the restaurant like pizza kitchen to hot prep which was a brutal physical job to bread baking to pastry to brunch wow. to pantry to line cooking uh uh purchasing uh, butchering yeah i kind of I, I i went through the whole gamut and i learned so much there i really uh was fortunate and a lot of people kind of kind of get pigeonholed they you know they work one position and then they move on and i was uh I was able to, uh, you know, that actually got me into the love of, 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 of meat and, yeah. you know, sausage making and uh, uh, making charcuterie and butchering, like and not butchering, like but we would get lamb, whole lambs yeah. in and butchering squab and quail and, you know, all so, this stuff. So, so we, the, I, I got yeah. exposed to a lot there. Uh, the I was people, very fortunate. Yeah. For the people in the chat, um, I think a lot of them have heard of Wolfgang Puck. Is there any other? Is that what you would so, think is uh, yeah, one of the most famous? With, with Wolfgang, I got to work with, uh, you know, at, at, at Post Trio, which is which is the equivalent of Spago down in L.A. Um, I worked with uh, George Marone in Aqua. Uh, I worked um, uh, with Dante Bacuse uh, at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel uh, in San Francisco and, um, uh, a lot of great chefs like Ming Tsai worked there before my time. I didn't get to work with him, but a lot of great chefs, uh, you know, kind of went through the halls there. Uh, that was kind of like my first sort of sous chef kind of big job there. Uh, I worked with Pat Coletto at his winery and, uh, and a couple of their chefs like Jan Birnbaum, um, he, 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 he passed away a couple of years ago to, uh, 
uh, Janelle Weaver, um, uh, wor working up in Napa. I've gotten to work with uh, uh, um, a lot of, you know, uh, chefs. So How about yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I've been fortunate. And then with the whole beast, I really got to, uh, you know, uh, besides just working in these small kitchens, I got to coll collaborate with them and, uh, uh, yeah. So what, and, and so that was the chefs. What about anybody that you've actually cooked for? Has there any, anybody, you know, that really stood out in your mind or someone, you know, famous that you, you know, that you cooked for maybe at one of those events? Well, like unbeknownst Napa, to or... me, uh, you know, when I was at post trio, I cooked, uh, Wolfgang Puck was always famous for doing his like big kind of gala events, like the Oscars and stuff. And we did this thing up in San Francisco, for the world form and it was mikhail gorbachev and george bush oh wow uh, and they showed up and that was uh 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 kind of big i, I got to cook uh, for bill clinton he came okay. into uh post trio that was uh and he was uh he enjoyed uh uh food and good food and he was super super personable and nice and kind of he, he actually went up and shook uh, a, a lot of the cooks and chefs hands and so uh -huh. um, yeah so like on, on the presidents and uh yeah i i, I i've been blessed that i've been fortunate i've cooked for a lot of uh yeah so uh, a lot of yeah a lot of um, but they're all regular people, people you know right they're they all, are they, they really are they really are so what is the most elaborate setup that you've had? Like you mentioned, like a lot of this outdoor, probably not in a kitchen, I wouldn't imagine, but I know you did a lot of outdoor, um, outdoor cooking and weddings and those kind of events. Do you have one specific, like, like really elaborate one or even maybe not just your cooking setup, but like the whole event, it was just, yeah, well, by sculptures um, or something. I don't know. I never told that delve into that. Uh, um, but, uh, the, um, well, as I said, like working at the hotel resorts early in my career, these huge, huge operations, but these were, you know, built in structures. But when you have to, when you're outdoors and you kind of have to, you know, create your own, uh, that, uh, you know, you have to build a kitchen and, uh, you have to build the, the, the kitchen according to, you know, to the landscape. And I would have to say like, Cooking in the Golden Gate Park uh, for outside lands, uh, for Hardly Strictly. Um, cooking uh, in Oakland uh, at Jack London Square uh, and cooking for, you know, outside lands. There was like two to 300,000 people that kind of walked through oh, wow. uh, that weekend to Hardly Strictly, which was well over half a million uh, plus that showed up to eat real, which was like, you know, 75 to, you know, 150,000. So that's a whole nother ball of wax. And, uh, you gotta have equipment. Um, and you have to b basically build a kitchen and then you have to have like, you know, uh, backup. So you have to have like a refrigerator truck. That's your like walk in to, oh, yeah. uh, you know, um, you know, when, when you're carving large animals, you're not cooking, you know, you're not doing this on like a, you know, like a big boost budding cutting board. I mean, I had like custom cutting boards that were like the size of me, you know, six foot long. And, you know, so I could put the whole animal on there and uh, big knives and uh, just big, everything uh, big, every, you know, and, 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 and that and that's just one aspect. You have to serve the food. So you'd have these kind of, you know, steamers to you know, having the line assembly, we would be making gyros or lamb salads or lamb burgers or, uh, you know, I'd be pulling, uh, you know, uh, carving a pig up and pulling pork and, you know, assembly from there. So, yeah, you know, and then but just, you know, not feeding uh, like a party of 10, like, you know, so learning on how to think on that big scale. So going back to my earlier days of cooking in those resorts, like, cooking yeah. for like 2000 people, uh, you know, I kind of had a grasp of the monumental. So it's like, so, yeah. you know, you, when you cook for yourself, it's a, it, it's, it's, it's completely different when you cook for a family, you know, all of a sudden you're cooking for like two, three, four, six, eight people. 
it, it it's it's a different thing when 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 you start for when then all of a sudden you're cooking for like a large group like 20 20 plus it's a whole nother ball of wax yeah then all of a sudden you're cooking for like 50 people it's another it's a whole nother you know situation and then you're cooking for 100 people uh you know so, <laughs> so you just uh, yeah so you just have to think it out but when I was cooking for these like large festivals like Metopia in San Antonio, Texas and in Oakland, just the amount of people and just the, you know, uh, you, you just got to, you know, uh, scale it up. But then also to control um, that type of cooking and the taste and I would be hands on, uh, you know, and really, you know, kind of coaxing and manipulating flavors and pulling you know, the meat out at the right time and letting it rest. And then, you know, and knowing, you know, uh, of course it tastes great when it comes out, but also, you know, how to, you know, uh, uh, serve it like an hour or two later. So to keep it, you know, uh, at its optimum temperature. I think that was, that was one of the questions that I had that, you know, maybe you guys in the chat want to know is like, how do you time your food? So it's like together. I mean, maybe not when you're serving like that, cause maybe that's just, you know, serving it as people order it and you give it to them, but like at a, at a banquet or something where everybody got to be served at the same time, you know, these, you know, well, that, well, that, that's the whole thing. How so, do you time it and make sure you know, it's all hot? So, you know, a, a <laughs> lot of, uh, you know, like in a banquet in a large, you know, kind of hotel situation, you have these hot boxes and, you know, I would kind of, I had like a, a cooker, uh, and I would, um, and not like a like a like a grill, but like a smoker. But it was it was huge, so I could kind of use that as like a holding kind of warming thing. But I would also have it timed, where um, uh, you know, I would be ready when the when the crowds hit, and then I would be able to you know move uh, uh, a line of a hundred, two hundred, three hundred people and feed those people, so they're not waiting in line, you know people have a short attention span, so they're not going to wait in line for uh, an hour. They're going to, you know, you got maybe 15 minutes. Uh, so to how to, you know, move that. And so I would actually, you know, they would get it like, you know, it would be done, rested and, you know, uh, ready to go. I would have it out. And uh, so they would really, you know, when you're cooking in that kind of large uh, arena, you, you have the luxury of like cooking a whole animal uh, and uh, but then, you know, pro, you know, processing it and getting rid of it real quick. Uh, so and I was able to kind of figure out the formula. But it, so, as I said, it kind of, you know, I, it, it, it took all my life experiences. Uh, um, so what about, so what about for like an Easter dinner where you're trying to get that food for maybe a family to come out? Like, do you type it? Uh... Well, that's a whole nother thing because family can make you crazy. So that puts okay. a whole nother stress, especially when you have family from oh, out yeah. of town and they have expectations and all this stuff. So, you know, there's a, there's a stress level. But, you know, um, thankfully for like a family of six or eight or ten, um, you know, you can do that out of the home kitchen, but you have to, uh, you kind of have to strategize and kind of prep. Uh, so you're not kind of um, freaking out the day of, and you're just sort of assembling and putting it together. You're not, yeah. you know, uh, so you're, you're, you're doing some prep work. You're doing the shopping a couple of days in advance. Um, and, uh, and also keeping it simple. Instead of trying to do this King Arthur type you know with all these different courses you know it's just family and you know just you know two or three side dishes and and and, and the keep main dish. yeah keep it simple and that's all they want and uh and then have somebody if you're not proficient in desserts you know bring have them bring it over a dessert or you just do it a day ahead of time and um and so you're not you know trying to do a five seven ball juggle so yeah. um mm -hmm. So but prep, you know, yeah. prep, you know, write out a prep list, do your shopping. Don't be trying to go out to the store and getting like a bunch of time, you know, on Sunday when everything's closed or something like that. And uh, try to start early and then, you know, enjoy, oh, enjoy the me. family. Yeah. Don't be, uh, you know, don't try to put on a King Arthur key, you know, kiss, keep it simple. Uh, yeah. And then just keeping the food warm. Is it okay to just put your oven on warm and stick stuff in there? Or is that wreck it? Yeah. Uh-huh. But it's be okay. careful. 
because you know you can dry it out too yeah so you wanna, keep it covered you know, dry it, um and then you know like especially like a like a ham well, 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 like a lamb, like we were talking about a leg of lamb, you know, you want to let it, you know, rest so it doesn't come out of the oven and then you start serving it. It comes out of the oven. You want to just barely kind of, you know, if you like it for a lamb, you kind of like it mid rare, uh, medium or rare, you know, it depends like 120, you pull it out, let it come up to temp carry over because when it sits it's still cooking so it will climb another five to ten degrees um oh. and then that gives you a lot of you know freedom to kind of do these last minute dishes like you know put the salad together or you know finish up the potatoes or you know do a quick uh saute of vegetables so you're letting the meat rest and then uh you know the juices kind of you know like leach out then they suck back in and then you know, and when I say rest, especially for a larger piece of meat, you know, uh, 25 minutes, 45 minutes uh, is, oh. uh, is quite adequate. And then you would just, uh, you know, tent it, like put a piece of parchment or foil, not cover it, but just sort of tent it so it can breathe. But you're also kind of keeping in the, uh, the, heat. Uh, the heat somewhat. And uh, um, yeah. It's not like a hot, juicy steak like a New York where you want it sizzling and, you know, you put it on the plate and it's literally, you know, uh, like it's it's like five minutes, you know, when you're, you know, like a, a roast, you want to let it rest. And it, it really it, it, it's uh, it's it's tenderer. It's juicier. Uh, it's uh, it's not as dry. And, and as I said, it, it, it gives you time to kind of heat up the sauce or make a sauce. Or finish sauteing the vegetables or, you know, uh, yeah, and everything finish else heated. <laughs> dressing the salad or, or, or something like that. And then also with these, uh, you know, big meals, I'm a huge uh, fan of this uh, salad because that brings people together. Everybody loves the vegetables. The more, you know, uh, uh, um, vegetables you eat, the better. But also, you know, it's a it, it's a good it's good for your digestion. Uh you know, just start off with the salad or soup, you know, and that kind of starts the, uh, the process. And so people aren't so hangry, you know, when it yeah. comes to like, you know, like the main event and, um, you kind of ease into it. So you have like these courses. So I'm a big fan of soup, uh, you know, for springtime, you know, there's, uh, leeks are, 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 are really going asparagus, uh, spring garlic uh so like a potato leek soup or asparagus soup uh uh or something like that um uh fennel um yeah and and then yeah so you yeah so you you do a soup or a pea soup uh you know uh, f fresh peas but the um or in a salad you know everything you know uh it's springtime so everything's excellent right now artichokes to carrots to fennel to leeks and all the fresh greens um and then uh yeah and then and then you have the main event and you're not you know you have your your, your protein uh and then you have a couple side dishes like you know rice or potatoes or pasta or a grain and then like a uh you know uh an oven roasted vegetable like maybe with a leg of lamb you want to put some parsnips and carrots and fennel in the yeah. roasting pan as you're roasting the you know uh the lamb you, you know so it's there. you know uh it, it's kind of being basted by the lamb fat and the juices and so you, you don't have another dish to deal with and uh um yeah so but don't don't try to have this multi like thanksgiving eight courses eight different side dishes and you know you're going crazy uh literally uh you know less yeah. is more Let's so, go. yeah, so we're coming up on a couple hours. <laughs> um, and oh, really? I want, I'm I, sorry. I, no, no, it's, it, we're, we're fine. And like, you uh -huh. know, we, yeah, I think great. people, that's great. People are enjoying this and, you know, I don't want, you know, you to get tired, but I know I, I, we have another question from Rhonda on the screen and then I had a couple questions. And then, like I said, I wanted to give you a chance to, to just tell people a little bit about your blended sausage. So Rhonda wanted to know, um, have you spent any time in the Atlanta food scene? Um, and if, if so, elaborate. I have not spent that much time in Atlanta. 
I did go to Atlanta and visited some college friends of mine when I was there at the Bougerie a year a year ago, uh, but nothing quote unquote in Atlanta. I have done some stuff in the South, like you know, my dad is from uh, grew up in North Carolina, um, and I, I I was able to participate in a couple of the uh, Charleston. Uh, uh, wine and food events in, in South Carolina. And that was, a a, a great experience, uh, doing some outdoor events like lamb stock in Virginia. Um, and, uh, I think I cooked in Greenville, South Carolina for a, uh, kind of like a special brunch, uh, one time a couple of years ago. Uh, but not Atlanta per se, but I'd be open for it because I, Love the state of Georgia, and you know, I, I went to college for five years in, in, in Florida, so I do like the uh, South. I still have family in North Carolina. My, you know, my dad uh, he's, uh, has moved on, passed away, but he has his like, you know, uh, we have our you know grandmother's place up in the mountains near Asheville, and my my brother lives uh, in the Chapel Hill area, and. Um, I have uh, a cousin down in Carborough, and uh, my wife's sister lives in Charlotte, uh, and I have a lot of friends all over North Carolina. So I, I, I spent a lot of summers in North Carolina in the, in the Blue Ridge, Smoky Mountains, a place called Camp Silo. So I, North Carolina is quite fond, has a special yeah. spot in my heart. So. So, uh, so one of the questions that I had, being you know you being a chef and having to cook things. What do you do when there's something you're cooking that you don't like? Like how, you know, there's got to be some food that you just can't stand to eat. But then if you have to make it for somebody, how do you, how do you know if it tastes good if you don't like how it tastes? Does that make sense? Like, Well, that's um, a, a, an interesting and a, a very good question because somebody, a lot of people have a lot of preconceived notions about food. I don't like this. I don't like that. And then, you know, um, it's great when you can uh, turn them on uh, to something that they don't like uh, because it's probably they haven't had it prepared right or cooked right or, or served right, you know, and um, a lot of people have aversions to like green bell peppers and um, uh, to, I don't like uh, uh, pork or I don't like lamb, like for, for example, lamb, a lot of people have an inversion of lamb because of the, uh, <laughs> I'm you one know, of them. <laughs> the flavor, it's like it's really gamey or that really lamminess. And, um, you know, uh, that old adage, you got to have mint jelly. Well, that's why they, you know, had mint jelly because it was such a strong flavor that it would neutralize it. It would you cover know, it up. But, but nowadays what they're doing with lamb and the way, the, the, you know, we're doing it, it's much more milder and it's a lot, uh, you know, so. But so to turn people on to uh, lamb, I really got into it uh and when it's cooked right and seasoned right and spiced right and you know not yeah. just by but, but of course by itself but then when you actually get to accent it with like a sauce or like a yogurt sauce or make it into a gyro or a salad and match it with a bunch of fresh veg uh uh then you really you know elevate it accent it you know you, you bring it to another level and then you know you people are like ah and that's one of the great things I love about cooking is you get this immediate feedback uh, from your work. And you don't get that in a lot of fields of, uh, of work or business. It takes you a while to kind of, you know, get that kind of feedback. But it's so immediate. And that's something really special. And then also, you don't have to be a chef. Uh, you know, to be a good cook. So, so, so some of the best cooks are not chefs, you know, like they're, they're, they're the grandmothers, uh, you know, that have been in the kitchen that have, have a lot of time underneath their belts and, but anybody can cook. Um, but there's going to be something you don't like to eat. Like oh, you like everything. I kind of have an open, uh, um, I kind of have an open mind. So I don't have, uh, that's good. I mean, that's yeah. good because I'm just thinking, you know, there, I you don't, know, I have do... a, I have a low tolerance for uh, poorly cooked or poorly executed food. I don't, uh, I, I don't like, uh, uh, 
but I, I will eat it. Uh, but, but, you know, I mean, but that's just, he hasn't had my tuna that's empanada, you guys. Being so high on the food chain, <laughs> uh, and that's um, uh, you know, uh, uh, but um, no, I don't have uh, too many like. preconceived like, oh, I hate this, or uh, and if I don't like it, I probably cooked don't. it or had it the wrong way, and then uh, and then when somebody, you know, you you know, and that that's another thing about like cooking too. You're always learning. So yeah. it's not, not that I, you know, for me, I've been cooking for 30 plus years, 35 years, you know, I know everything. No, I'm always learning. So I'm like, I'm so, I, I, I'm really a student and I'm so humbled by uh, this profession because just when you think you, you know, you know something or, you know, uh, you, or, you know, you get a good handle on it. Yeah. There's, uh, you know, somebody else teaches you another method or another way. And you're like, wow. I have yeah. no idea. And so I like that. Uh, do you feel like you're coming up with your own, do you, do you feel like you have to create your own recipes at this point now, or do you have, like, well, so that's created? another thing. Some people, and I love, uh, I, I, I have like a joke, but some people live and die by the recipe. I gotta have the recipe. Uh, um, a recipe is, uh, is essential. It's a guideline, but it's kind of like a outline. And some people follow it to the letter of the law, like, oh, we got to do this. And, uh, you know, some people that are in the business or a chef, you can just say, oh, you know, you need like, you know, an orange, uh, some oregano, a little garlic and some shallot. And then, you know, you just put it together. But you don't need all these, you know, oh, I get it. You know, and, and uh, you know, some people need specific instructions and, you know, how, how much, how much of this or that, that. And they, you get so caught up on the... Uh, you know, the letter of the law, the whole, like, you know, you got to do this and this and that. And then it becomes, well, for me, it becomes tedious, but, you know, it's, it's a guide, but it's not like, uh, and then you get to, and, you know, like, um, sometimes your, your mistakes are your best, uh, uh, are yeah. the best things, like happy mistakes. And then you really <laughs> learn like, oh, I don't want to do this. Or, you know what, I didn't mean to do this, but I actually like the way that turned out. Well, so I'm going to adopt that practice or I'm going to do that the next time. And then, so that recipe is actually a guideline. And then you might make some mental notes or probably, you, uh, you know, you want to make some, you know, some personal notes. And so when you go back to that, you know, thing you did a year ago or two years ago, um, you can recreate oh, like, it. Oh yeah. I forgot that. So, but so like, uh, you know, a recipe is basically, you know, a guide, uh, to it. And, you know, um, some, you know, sometimes when you mess up, like it, it turns out even better. Uh, it's, so it, yeah, that's it really true. does. It's true. Uh -huh. And other people in the chat know that I don't follow the recipes very well when I'm cooking. Cause I'll be like, mm -hmm. Oh, I don't have that. I'm just going to stick some of this in there or whatever, but my food doesn't usually turn out, turn out quite so well. The probably the things that I'm substituting it with. So that's kind of, it's kind of a, a joke. It's kind of funny, but I make this chili too, that my family liked. And then I can, and Garrett's like, you can never make it the same way twice. Like every time you make it, it like totally tastes different. <laughs> so, well, I see mean, now, now that's, uh, you know, um, uh, there's a lot of truth in that statement and that's where, <laughs> you know, consistency and all of a sudden you like, you develop like people like, you know, chili. Oh, I love, I love Michelle's chili. And then I'll say, it's like, I'm going to be doing this. And then you know, oh, I had it and I'm going to go back next year. Oh, but it's a little different. So that's when you have to have a recipe. Yeah. And that's when you have to follow it to the letter of the law uh, because you want to make it the same way. And, you know, as I mentioned, like what what really was, you know, uh, it still blows me away is that you can give a recipe that you've done plenty of times and you give it to somebody else and then it will really turn out completely, you know, different. And you're like, no, 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 I gave that. So I, I, I you know, uh, so when you do that, now like when you gluten, talk about like, chili, yeah. I find that chili is actually a true American uh, product because um, you're kind of capturing a lot of different regions of America. Everybody has a little bit different, but Twist. it's kind of the same, but it's really a complex uh product because there's a lot of ingredients there's a lot of technique there's different proteins you can you know yeah. mash a lot of proteins or just have one specific 
the vegetables, the spices uh, that you can put into it. And it actually becomes, um, you know, uh, it reminds me of some very complex, like French dishes, like a beef bourguignon. Uh, but it's kind of like that because there's a lot of layers and uh, of flavor and spices and techniques. And, you know, yeah. and when you uh, make a good chili, everybody, every American loves a good chili. Every yeah. American. Oh, it's a good it, chili, so. Yeah, it's hard to sometimes recreate it. So mm -hmm. um, let's see. All right. Why don't you just um, tell us a little bit about your um, your uh, what is it? Your uh, blended sausage project. So, so yeah, thanks for talking about that. So, you know, the whole beast has been kind of put on hold. I've been kind of consulting, which means advising, uh, giving advice. Uh, but with, um, you know, with the pandemic that been going on for over a year now uh you know my outdoor cooking events uh large group of people that's a complete no-no so i i was actually fortunate uh, i kind of saw the handwriting on the wall and i kind of shut down my operation last march so i um uh was not like a lot of my other fellow chefs and colleagues uh that really had to uh, redesign the wheel per se. And, uh, it's been difficult and it's been heartbreaking, but, um, this blended sausage, I've been working with a, uh, a well-known, uh, sausage maker, Bruce Adele, uh, Adele sausage. He's, yeah. you know, made a, a, a empire name for himself. And ironically, I've had known Bruce for a long time. I, was at the farmer's market with him at Post Trio or at the Ferry Building uh, when it was in the parking lot. And he had a stand and he was selling the sausages and we were selling our sausages at Post Trio and so on and so forth. So Bruce and I go way back, but we started working um, to get, uh, I started kind of doing some talks and, and demos with him with, uh, you know, the whole beast and these kind of meat and butcher conferences and pork, pork summits and stuff like that. And we sort of befriended each other. And of course, you know, Bruce is, uh, you know, uh, an entity onto himself and, yeah. you know, he liked me and I liked him and, uh, we started becoming friends and we, uh, about for two years, we've been working on this, uh, blended sausage products. So the alternative meat industry has completely, you know, taken off beyond meat and possible burgers. And they have really, uh, I, it's, it's amazing how popular it's gotten their marketing and, but really the amount of, uh, uh, venture capital and funding that they have received, it's, it's mind boggling. And, um, yeah, I don't think you're going to re replace the, you know, especially with the American palate, uh, the meat industry. But we were working on a, a blended sausage product uh, where uh, we were using this uh, thing called Leica Plus, which is like these five ingredients like shiitakes and wheat gluten and barley and water and uh, a starch. And um we were doing like a 75% pork, 25% Leica. And we were uh, making these sausages in his test kitchen up at his place in Hillsburg at his house. And um, wow, we were really blown away by, um, you know, uh, uh, one, you're using less meat. So this is an answer to the meat industry, eat less meat. But um you know, it, some people call this like a, a filler, but it's not really, uh, um, you know, you're, you're reducing a lot of the calories, uh, some of the uh, bad effects of saturated fat and cholesterol with, with the meat, but you're yeah, also right. enhancing the, uh, the, 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 the properties of meat. Like you're, it, it holds in the juices, the, uh, like the fat, the meat juices, the myoglobins and, um, it actually extends the shelf life of it. Uh, and um, we were been working on this for about two years. And last November, we kind of nailed it. Uh, and uh, we were really happy with what, uh, you know, our work has come out with. And um, I have uh, joined aboard uh, this company that's making this like a plus. Uh, and um, we're, uh, um, I, uh, this Bring is kind of like the answer. Uh, yeah. So I'm, we're working on this and it's, um, 
uh, it's the blended sausage and it's just not, you know, pork sausage. This is also lamb sausage. It also has applications to all ground proteins. So like, especially burgers and, uh, so you can cook something well done, but it still retains its juiciness. It's not dry. Uh, and now it's, you know, we're having a lot of, uh, captains of industry and uh players starting to look at this product like the pork board the lamb board the usda and you know there's some military applications and school lunches and this is kind of like next you know like like what 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 we're yeah. you know um doing so with it's uh you know can, can can be like uh uh will be uh, affecting 20 to 30 years down the line but also it's promoting the animal industry by using less meat um and then it has a lot of uh positive like kind of you know lessen the carbon footprint um uses less water like the animal uh you know how much water you know it takes to uh to grow and to finish an animal to uh all, all this stuff so it has a you know a carbon footprint which is starting to become a big buzzword and uh you know our current practices of in the animal industry are are actually quite unsustainable so something's got to change and uh but it's been it's been it's been mind-boggling with this alternative meat i don't know if it's going to be a complete replacement i think uh but it's been very positive to see uh how 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 american the, the their, their their palates uh are and, and their knowledge and, and they're and they're willing to accept it and especially the younger generation but also the older generation and um you know the previous like 20 years ago making like you know meatless patties like with you know beans or lentils yeah. or something like that they, 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 they you know you can make them taste good but they were still missing that kind of you know, meat, meat that <laughs> mouth feel. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, uh, so these are like, so these are blended. They're alternate. It's called alternative meat, but it's not like a non-meat product. No, no, it's no, like no. A, so it's so like a blended. The, the, this, the thing is like the Leica plus and it's, you, you add it to meat. So we're not replacing it. And it's, um, but uh, you're, you know, you're using less meat. So on the large scale of things, like, you know, in the home use, oh, I, I'm eating less meat. So instead of, you know, eating a four ounce link of sausage or a four ounce burger patty, you know, I'm only eating three ounce. But when you're talking about like on the grand scale of things, that's a huge, huge uh, uh, reduction, you know, uh, 25% because, it's, you know, we're, we're talking hundreds of millions of tons, you know, yeah. of, of meat. So that's a huge, huge number. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, these big boys uh, like Nestle, Impossible Foods, Beyond, which is Pepsi, uh, the, um, Burger King, you know, tried a, a campaign with the Impossible Burger uh, or the Impossible Whopper. And um, they're starting to take notice. And there's, you know, um, and uh, uh, so I think this is a, a trend toward the future. And then for me, it's always like another aspect of learning uh what else can i do in the food industry and um yeah. it's not like I've, I've done everything as a chef but i just feel like i'm growing as a chef and i find that this is uh uh fascinating and then also i'm using a lot of my uh experience i know a lot of meat people in the united states and and and, yeah. and in other countries so i'm kind of using a lot of my whole beast uh knowledge and contacts and everybody that I've kind of shook hands or broke bread with or had a glass of wine or beer or just talked with or, you know, I gave a class, um, you know, I'm kind of reconnecting and it's uh, it, it's actually been quite gratifying. And uh, I you know, and I feel, you know, so I'm kind of doing this, this kind of got, you know, I was kind of looking at like, you know, like another aspect of. Uh, 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 of growing myself and, you know, being in the industry and with the pandemic, it really has shaken up the whole food industry and restaurants. And yeah, um, it's not like I've mastered anything, but I just feel like I'm growing. And, um, but also there's just a lot of interest and monies uh, and to be kind of 
you know, uh, involved in a, uh, a movement, a decision, you know, uh, that can really, you know, affect uh, a large amount of people and, and do something good, you know, health wise. And, uh, and, and then for the environment, I kind of really, um, uh, am excited to be, uh, involved with it. So, yeah, uh, it, yeah I'm like, it uh, sounds exciting. you know, I'm a, a part, part of this company, uh, and I'm on the, the board and business development director of business development, but yeah, I'm kind of reconnecting a lot of my old contacts and also the meat industry is kind of going through another movement because they're trying to like rediscover themselves because the, uh, you know, the fake meat, the alternative meat has really kind of, um, the way they marketed, uh, th themselves. And, uh, so meat, is kind of being demonized somewhat and they're kind of trying to reinvent. So this, this could be a, uh, a good, um, uh, uh, yeah. Thing it's for, funny. For... Cause I, I go to the grocery store and, and I like, like about, like, yeah. as I said, uh, school lunches, yeah. we all, you know, uh, grew up with, uh, you know, school lunches in there, you know, they haven't gotten better <laughs> over the years. And it's been, I've had a lot of, you know, people that have worked for me, chef friends, and it's just an exasperating, but you're literally working with like, you know, big government and states and industries that you just are, uh, you know, uh, you know, scale of beyond, like it's so hard to change. And, but to actually make a stent and a scratch in the, in the school lunch program, uh, is, uh, boy, that's kind of like a, a thing that has kind of irked me for a long time. And if I can, you know, yeah. Be, have a small little thing about that. I, I, I would, you know, be quite gratifying. Yeah. It, I mean, it's hard, I think with this, those kind of programs, cause they're trying to cut costs, you know, and just use whatever the well, are. You know, quite, the yeah, quite stuff. frankly, now with the new administration, uh, you know, uh, the previous one, they, 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 you know, they, they, they had a different outlook and now we have, uh, somebody, uh, uh, from Obama, from the USDA and they're, really uh you know uh their interest is peaked on this product too and um so we'll yeah. we'll, we'll 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 see how that goes but so uh, is is the alternative meat already in the market like through with different different brands or is that something that's just new and it's not quite hit the market yet or is it only you know strictly with like what like the alternative what? meat product like the one the blended the alternative meat products are out there right yeah, so like Impossible Burger. Okay, because I, I, yeah. Meat, Gardenia. Um, uh, God, there's quite a few of them, but. Yeah, I'm always yeah, afraid because uh, I never know if so they're, they're like. And they're burgers actually or... have made a, a huge impact. Ironically, they're just as expensive, if not more expensive than, you know, yeah. uh, uh, the meat uh, per se itself. But um you know, um, they're, uh, yeah, it's, it's made a huge impact and people are trying it and they've actually, you know, done a good job, uh, and they made it taste, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's not exactly a substitute, <laughs> but, uh, it, they're, 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 they're getting pretty close to it. So, and people like that. So, so the blended sausage that you're working on, you mentioned, the, uh, uh, what you're blending it with the, the product. Um, it's called like a plus, uh, and um do so, you have a, a glue because it sounded like you had wheat in there right like some kind of grain or something yeah you that's a gluten free a, version you know, uh, wheat, but it's um you know uh the the argument with that is um when you're having like a burger or a sausage you're usually putting it on a bun so you're kind of already having gluten yeah uh, and, uh so um yes uh but that's um yeah, uh, I, 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 uh, so it's, it, yeah, so it's not, it's it, not gluten free because, you, you know, know yeah. yeah, which is a whole nother subject on yeah. itself. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, gluten intolerant, but it's actually just the way wheat is grown these days and how it's processed. And, you know, we don't really eat whole wheat breads uh, or whole grains, uh, you oh. know, it's kind of, you know, we take the, the, you know, the whole of the bran off and then, uh, oh, uh okay. yeah. Something so then different. you're having a whole, you know, it enters your system very quickly. Uh, and then, 
spikes your sugar and yeah. insulin and decrease all that stuff. So uh, that's why a lot of people have, uh, you know, they say they, they, they say they're because they're they're quite frankly uh, eat, eating some awful, awful uh, processed bread. And uh, oh, that'd be um, me so. probably. <laughs> That's, so that'd be were, a lot of us that'd be a lot yeah, of us so. i like bread i've been like making bread i like to make bread though that is one mm-hmm. thing well that, that yeah and then that's you know and then so, you know like there's been a huge bread resurgence especially with the pandemic but um these kind of you know whole grain breads and you know slow fermentation high hydration uh uh they really make a difference but like they're um uh and your body's able to process them and they're you know not so quickly uh uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, so you don't, you don't have these, um, sugar highs, adverse reactions that a lot of people have when they're, you oh. know, gluten intolerant, which is, uh, some GI digestive issues and stuff like that. So my family has those every time I cook. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so do you have any tips like, uh, you know, as we wrap up, like a tip, um, uh, any kind of, any kind of the, maybe like the biggest tip in the kitchen or in your home, like as far as, you know, anything that might be helpful that they may not already know, <laughs> um, like proper food planning or- prevents poor performance. What is and that? that means whole, uh, proper planning prevents poor performance. So, okay. you know, um, having a clean kitchen, having an organized kitchen. Uh, and what I mean that like, you know, uh, so when you're ready to cook, you don't have to clean just so you can cook. You kind of go in there and you start cooking, um, having an organized kitchen. So everything, you know, where everything is, it's not like you open up that drawer and there's like 35 different things, you know, you have, uh, you know, you know exactly where it is. So you can actually sort of cook blindfold, you know, where this is, you know, where that is, um, simplify, which means, you know, less is more, you don't need eight saute pans. All you need is kind of like three, you know, cooking pots. You need a couple different sizes. Um, and then ingredients, you don't need that, you know, uh, that cabinet of spices that was handed down from your grandmother, you know, uh, <laughs> uh spices don't last forever. And so to uh-huh. rotate them, less is more, you don't need to buy the Costco, you know, two pound size that lasts for five years, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, six ounces is enough for six months or something like that, or peppercorns or, or stuff like that. So fresh is better. Uh, then, More then, like- and, then, and then also like a, a clean fridge and not so cluttered, but also what's in that fridge, uh, you know, it's just not a, a holder for ketchup and mustard and all these condiments, you know, you have, you know, a clean fridge, but you have fresh produce and you know, you just don't shove it in there, you know, you kind of clean it and, you know, uh, you do a little prep work, but you know where everything is. A fridge doesn't work properly when it's, you know, 95% full. A fridge works properly when it's 45 to 50% full because you have air circulation. Uh, buying your meats, um, you don't need to, you know, buy like two weeks worth of protein, you know, with the American food system, you know, the, uh, the grocery stores, the farmer's markets, your butcher shop, you know, they have the big refrigerator. So you can just go in there and, you know, buy what you need for like two days or something, uh, you know, fish, you don't want to buy like a week ahead of time and then use it a week later. You want to, you know, like, 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 like some old, old, old rules, you know, you buy the fish, you want to use it that day. Uh, you know, when I say produce, you know, go, instead of buying it from the grocery store, buy, Farmers markets are really popular, especially with the pandemic, you know, outdoor shopping. Uh, uh, you're not getting all those pesticides and paraffins and wax on the uh, on the produce and they're picking it when it's ripe instead of when it's underripe. It's, you know, it's not three weeks old. It's two days old, you know, at the farmer's yeah. market or the next day. And it just lasts that much longer. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, we're kind of finishing up the citrus season. So when you buy your citrus from the produce market, you know, it doesn't have that paraffin wax on it. And then you can use the zest and, you know, it doesn't last as long, but, you know, you don't need to buy like, you know, uh, a case of oranges. Uh, all you need to buy is like five pounds and that lasts a week and everybody, you know, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So proper planning prevents poor performance. And, you know, we're a really modern day society. So you don't need to like bulk up. You don't need like, 
to have your freezer packed with like six months of provisions and uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the grocery stores are not, you know, going out. We're not in an apocalyptic state. Uh, and, um, yeah, so, uh, you, you, you know, you don't want your, your, your cabinets packed with stuff. And then, you know, all of a sudden you have like flour that's, you know, it's been in there for like a year to two years, you know, or rice or stuff, you know, stuff like that. Uh, uh. Everything, no, nothing lasts forever, especially in the food world. Well, that so, just explained yeah. all of my cooking problems right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. uh, oh, well, thank you. Those are some really good, uh, some, those are really uh, good, helpful tips. Some that I have to take to heart, maybe go clean my refrigerator and organize my spice drawer. Um, do you have any spice final- Spice drawer is huge. Uh, yeah. yeah. Because I, I mean, <laughs> I have, I, I, I am guilty as uh uh, but, uh, um, you know, sometimes you have like that good spice that somebody hooked you up with and it's like four oh, years yeah. old, but it's, it's no good. And I remember, <laughs> you know, my mom literally had like, <laughs> you know, my grandmother was oh, like, yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and it's like, I think it's like 35 years old. It's like, come on, that's not, um, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 you know, it, it's had its day. So oh, this Hello. is another one. <laughs> it's Gabriel. Yeah. Um, so, and do you, and do you have like a last, maybe tip of encouragement or something, um, you know, you want to let people know kind of something positive, like, you know, you can, anybody can cook. <laughs> you any, know, it's any, true. Anybody cook. And especially in this day and age, uh, anybody can cook because now that, you know, we have access to the internet and recipes, uh, and, uh, and, and techniques, you can check it out on YouTube. You can look up a recipe and get a, you know, instead of just one recipe that you got from your cookbook that your mom handed down to you, now you can get a recipe of, you know, 10 different or 12 different or 20 or 50 different recipes for this one dish. And then you can kind of, oh, I like the way they're doing that. Oh, I like these ingredients. And then sort of formulate your own kind of recipe, uh, you know, to do this. So, See, you guys can do it. I can do it. <laughs> anybody you can. can. Cook. Anybody if I can, can cook. Anybody can cook. <laughs> well, and it's actually uh it's a it's a good it, it's a good trait. And then also, you know, with this pandemic, uh, it has forced us to be inside. Um, a lot of restaurants have closed. Restaurants have kind of streamlined and simplified. So uh, they're. Um, um, they're not the same as they used to be because they just have less people and they just can't, you know, uh, they still have, you know, high standards, but it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's always better, you know, uh, uh, you know, when, when you, and, and gratifying when you're, you're cooking something at home for you and your loved one or your family. And it's yeah. actually kind of, um, you know, a little, a little less expensive. And then when you're growing your own vegetables and you're, you know, you're kind your yard, of yeah. garden, like herbs to your backyard where you're growing, you know, it's always better or, you know, patronizing a farmer's market. And um, yeah. yeah, our, our, you know, like I have to say, you know, we have really upped the game. Like I can say that, you know, since when I started cooking, uh, when I went, started getting serious about cooking, going to cooking school, in the early nineties, we have really upped our game in the United States, uh, with our food. It's, it's amazing. And, um, uh, so, uh, f cooking good food is, uh, is, is a lot easier than it was before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And speaking of, I was going to say there was one more, uh, Roger, Roger uh, <laughs> said, speaking of organized fridge, do you remember when you found Eddie's steak located in the Delta Chi refrigerator? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I will take that one to my grave. Uh, I remember, yes, I remember, uh, uh, being inebriated and, you know, uh, scoffing, uh, Eddie's hot dogs, uh, at one o'clock in the morning, not by myself, but with a couple other, uh, fraternity brothers of mine but there's I, something I, gross I, in the fridge i guess no i don't think oh. there's ever anything gross but oh. i think i was i took the oh. liberty of uh uh instead of going out to Get. waffle house at two o'clock in the morning you just ate was in the fridge i just ate what was in the fridge and uh <laughs> uh, uh i became uh 
Public Henry number one. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it wasn't just me. There was other people that partook, but I, I took the heat all the time for it. So. <laughs> well, I'll admit it. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, we really enjoyed having you here, John, and, and hopefully uh, hopefully you enjoyed being here with us. And uh, I did. I did. I yeah. really, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And, and thanks to all the people who came in the chat. Um, we really appreciate it. If anybody's new here and you haven't been before, um, you know, be sure and subscribe. It's free to our channel and hit the bell so you'll know anytime we do um, go live or it's if we post so videos. Yes, give um, give John some hearts in the chat there and some claps. <laughs> um, and um, just let him know that you really enjoyed enjoyed um, you know his his interview here with us tonight. And, um, yeah, it was a nice little uh, open table talk. Yeah. So, like I said, we really enjoyed it. And um, we'll be looking for that new alternative meat coming out someday. Like <laughs> the sausages, I guess, the, the blended sausages we'll be looking for. And uh, we'll, we'll know the background. Well, I will. Yeah. So, like, I'm not going to be having my own label. This is yeah. for co-packers yeah. where companies will, you know, do this. So this is... Uh, you know, I'm kind of uh, uh, behind, the uh, on the, behind the scenes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It sounds interesting, though, for mm -hmm. sure. So. All right. Well, um, okay. so, uh, yeah, I just uh, you guys can hang out in the chat. We'll stay here for a little bit longer. I know we had I know I think Mike had to go. He had a birthday in the house. And um, I think I don't think Tim's in the chat either. So we might have to do our birthdays. We might have to sing yeah, our birthday okay. song another and on another stream. So if anyone doesn't know, we stream Sundays, uh, Wednesdays, and Friday nights at 6 p.m. Pacific. So um, we'll be back on Wednesday. And um, yeah, so we hope to see you there. And then we'll let we'll let John we'll let John head off. <laughs> and, oh, by uh, the way, so, yeah, thank yeah. you. You know that was so funny uh, hearing a uh, a blast from the past. Uh, <laughs> was that Roger? Yeah. James that chimed in about eating Eddie's food. I think it is. He's in the chat. Yeah, it says Roger Hood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's probably Roger. We can, tell, we can tell Roger, you know, we, we, we Michelle, you're talking about chili. I remember uh, uh, Roger was uh, self anointed uh, making his chili uh, <laughs> in college. And uh, I think uh, whenever he turned his back, I always had to uh, add a little bit of this and a little bit of that to his, uh, his chili that uh, I, I helped uh, enhance it. So oh, I was good. always looking out for him. Uh, yeah well we appreciate all you guys joining in the chat it you know it made it um interesting and sorry i didn't get to interact with you more but i had to talk to john <laughs> and um yeah so hopefully you know maybe maybe we'll have you back someday if you want to come okay back. sure I, be i'd be more than happy to okay all right okay have a good okay. night john thanks okay happy easter happy easter bye-bye mm -hmm. So who do we all have? We have everyone, everybody here who's uh, still around. Um, what did you guys think? Hopefully you liked that. We've been working on um, getting some new folks to interview. And um, I think a lot of you know, I told you that we have another one coming up in April um, on our Sunday night stream, who is a Hollywood stunt actor um, who has um, trained to do Jack Sparrow on, um, who was in the show for, um, he trained for the show Phantasmic in Fantasmic in Disneyland on the, the pirate ship is the role Jack Sparrow. Um, so he's got a little bit of the behind the scenes of Disney um, information for that. And then he was also in The Dark Knight. Um, I think he was a, a stunt driver in that movie. So some really exciting um, things coming up. So we want to make sure that you are subscribed and you'll know when those, um, those interviews are on. So um, let me know in the chat, what did you guys... Um, what did you guys think? Let's see who's still here. We got Rhonda still here. Lady Jamie, Jamie's still here. <laughs> um, Andrea's here. That was so cool. Um, let me see who else is in here. Anne's here and Jonathan's still here. So, um, are there any questions that you wanted to ask John that maybe you didn't get to ask him or were too embarrassed to ask? I don't think you guys are embarrassed. You guys don't get embarrassed much. I know. So, um, I forgot to, I wanted to ask him if like most kitchens have bugs, but maybe that's just not appropriate. Maybe that's like top secret behind the scenes. Like maybe we don't want to know what's really in the professional kitchens, but I know I've heard stories of like rats and stuff. So <laughs> oh, nice. 
But let's see. Why don't everyone know my niece has gone home from the hospital today? Oh, good. Oh, that's great. Yes. You know what? Why don't we do that? We'll um, we'll do our prayer time. We'll do our prayer requests. I'm like a little shorter today. How do you like our new setup? Um, <laughs> it's not a setup. I just it's like we're not so far away. I'm not like so far back. Um, so we take prayer requests for anybody who is in the chat that doesn't um, know to um, see if there's anything you want us to pray for during the week and you can send it. You don't have to put it in the chat. You can put it in the chat so we know um, if it's more private and you don't want people to know. You can Instagram um, on a DM on Instagram to me at my monarch moments or you can email me at my monarch moments at gmail.com if you want to reach me that way. Um, so we'd be happy to um to pray for anything you have going on or any people that you know might need prayers this week. And um, you don't have to wait until we're streaming either. You can always uh, send those requests to us any anytime during the week. And um, just, uh, we've got, I'm trying to think, did we have a, we had a praise for some, we had a praise for something. I can't remember what it was. We like praise reports too. If, if things are going well for people, we have a praise report. We're going to get our vaccination. So that's kind of exciting. <laughs> um, so I think that's like, uh, yeah, one of our, one of our praise reports. Um, other than that, let's see, make sure if I, if I'm missing anything, I want to let everyone know. Yeah. Thank you for letting us, uh, thank you for letting us know that Stacy, cause we do like to get feedback, um, and hear how, how everybody's doing. And I know, um, I think Mikey was here earlier. Hopefully, hopefully Mikey, you're, you're having an okay day. We're still lo loving and praying for you that, um, you know, that you'll be feeling better soon. Um, and let me see, I'll give you guys some time to put any requests in. Um, yes. Thank you to our moderators. Um, thank you guys for uh, moderating the chat. I wasn't able to pay as much attention tonight um, as I usually can. So thank you for that. And I'm thinking, um, what about, so Easter, are any of you guys thinking of making um, any kind of special meal for Easter Sunday. Um, I don't think we've thought that far ahead. I wouldn't mind attempting a turkey again because I, now that I know what I did wrong with my turkey, like maybe I could, um, maybe I could try and do another turkey. We're not big lamb eaters. Um, I don't know if you guys like lamb. I'm not a big lamb eater, but like, but like John said, maybe it's just because of, you know, the person cooking it. So, <laughs> um, Hey Matt. Hello and all. Goodbye. Seem like you're about to end. Oh yeah, that's okay. Thanks for coming in. Um, we had our um, we had our. You just lost your feed. Oh, I lost my feed. What happened? Oh, it's over. No. Oh, can they hear me? Yeah. Oh, it's my camera. I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. It just we pooped out our camera quite a few times tonight. Um, good to see you, Matt. Um, Oh, we have to figure out, we're going to figure out that timeout thing. Uh, record, but, yeah. Oh, is that what you have to do? Hit record. Um, I'm bringing some kind of sides and a dessert to your sister's house. What's a good side? Oh, you know what I was thinking? Okay. I'm going to tell you this. Garrett doesn't know this yet. Um, <laughs> it's just an idea if I can find all the parts, but, um, you guys know my mom passed away and for Easter, she was really, that was like one of her favorite, um, holidays of the year. And she used to make this lamb cake. So speaking of lambs, it's a tradition um, to celebrate um, with a lamb. But what she used to do is make a lamb cake. And we have this, actually, it's actually a mold where you, uh, you put the cake in either side of the mold. So you bake the cake and then you put the mold together and you set it up. So your cake actually sits up and it looks like a little lamb. And then she would decorate it and she would put, uh, she would take coconut, like, shredded coconut and like dye it green and it would look like grass and have the lamb like sitting in the grass and then decorate the lamb cake. So I was thinking maybe Friday night, um, I could maybe already have it baked and then maybe we could like, um, decorate it. Maybe that's an idea for Friday night stream. So we'll see if you guys like it. Let me know if you think it's a terrible idea. You can let me know well, also. We might do like a blind taste test. Oh, okay. So in Wednesday night stream, um, we might be doing a blind taste from, test. Uh, it's Joey's world. Oh, it's Lisa. Joey's world. Oh, Lisa's idea. Oh, okay. Is is are, is anybody gonna join us for the taste test? No. It's oh, okay. It's just between me and there. me and Hannah. <laughs> just wondering. Uh, so anyway, um, 
But thank you guys so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, we want to bring you guys uh, good content, things that you find interesting or maybe helpful. I hope you learned some tips. I know I got some tips um, definitely about my kitchen <laughs> um, and my refrigerator. So hopefully um, you learned something. I wanted to ask him about air fryers and, and instant pots, but we ran out of time. So I think he's just going to have to come back. Maybe yep. maybe some Friday he can pop in and like just do a Q&A and then we can ask him about all our appliances and stuff. How, how we can best utilize it or make the food taste good when we use that kind of stuff. So uh, Michelle's dish on Friday looked awesome. Oh, thanks, Jonathan, our matzo ball soup. Actually, that idea came from Chef John because we were just talking about it and he was talking about how this was going to be Passover. And, um, and like, you know, I like to do things on Friday of things that I've never done before. So I, Gabriel didn't like the matzo balls. I actually really liked it. Um, and I don't think Garrett, it was okay, but I don't think he was a fan of the matzo balls either. So I don't know how often I'll be making it, but, um, it, it I, th I, it was like something I actually liked. So it is very light. Like, um, it wasn't a real heavy, like a super flavorful soup, but that could be my seasoning too. I don't think it's supposed to have a whole ton of flavor. So anyway, um, I kind of missed that, but I think you were talking about a, a cake. Oh, what is Rhonda saying? All right. I'm going to let you guys um, go because I have to cool mold. mold. Yeah, it's a mold. So, um, oh, you did that with a bunny. Lady Jamie says, yes, a freeze a cake and it's easier to decorate. Oh, Cool. Thanks, Rhonda. So maybe I'll make the cake and then I, we can decorate it on Friday. Um, yeah, I was talking about a cake. I was talking about a lamb cake that my mom used to always use for a celebrate for Easter. Because if we make it on Friday, then we'll have it for like e over the Easter weekend. So anyway, and just, you know, kind of a way to honor her memory. You know, another thing that we used to do for Easter, I don't know if you guys have Easter traditions and I know I need, I said I was going to go, but um, there's Polish. Have you guys seen the Polish Easter eggs? Do I still have one? I think I broke them. Uh, but I used to deck. Is it up there? I used to decorate them. Uh, well, I, my mom got me this decorating kit and, um, I think that would be, unfortunately, I didn't think of it soon enough cause it's like kind of too late to do it. But, um, uh, with beeswax and they're really, they're called, there's a name, but they're like Polish Easter eggs. And if you've ever seen them, they're gorgeous. They're very intricate designs. And it's done with beeswax. And so you layer the, um, you layer the dye on the eggs and it's like a really highly pigmented dye. Some of them are even black and you, um, so you start with your egg and if you want anything white, you put, you, you decorate the part that you want white with the beeswax. And so you go around with this, uh, you melt it with a little match and then it's almost like a cake decorating thing and it melts and it comes out this little tip of the little point and you go around the egg like that. And then when you get everything covered and you want it, that part white, then whatever the next color that's lighter, like a yellow, then you dip your egg in the yellow um, dye. And then once that comes out and dries, then anything you want yellow, like the center of a flower, you, uh, you start, you, you paint that in with your, um, your dye, you cover all or with your wax, you cover all the part you want yellow. And then you keep doing that. You keep dyeing it till it gets darker and darker and darker until whatever, like the last color is. And you keep putting layers of wax on. So by the end, the egg is like really ugly and it's just covered in this big ball of wax. And then you kind of let it set and then you melt with a, with a candle or with a, a flame, you melt all the wax off and it just melts away. And it's this egg with like these beautiful colors and these designs and flowers or whatever kind of design that you want to put on it. Um, and, I, and you, the, the eggs are usually hollow, like you blow them out. So, um, it doesn't have the, so you can keep them and then you can shellac them when they're done, but they're very, very fragile. So unfortunately I had one that I really liked and I think we broke it and I'd had it for, I want to say I had it for like 25 years and I tried to keep it like really carefully, but you know, kids came along and, and then it got broken, but, um, uh, just write Daniels. Oh, he just wanted to pray with his parents to get vaccinated. Oh, okay, Daniel. I'll write that down. Um, Daniel, parents, um, to get a date, um, pray to get, to get, to get vaccinated. Okay. I will, I will cover that. Um, oh yeah. You know what? We are going to be doing a, are we, yeah, we are doing a stream on Easter Sunday, right? Yeah. Cause it's a Sunday. I believe we're, I believe we're doing a stream. I don't think we've canceled anything. So. 
that's the plan. But um, anyway, I, I, like I said, I wish I thought of those eggs earlier. And maybe if I can dig out my supplies, that maybe I can do something like that. But I think it's kind of time consuming. So it's just kind of something, a fun tradition um, that I did when I was younger. And uh, I don't think I have the patience for anymore. But those, if you see those eggs, that's how they do it. Um, they're called like they're the Polish, um, the Polish Easter eggs. So anyway, um, yeah, we'll pray for your parents, Daniel. Um, message chat. Oh, okay. I will look for um, Andrea. I'll look for your message on Instagram, and um, to go either. Oh, you guys, that's right. Yeah, there are some people are going down to. Um, a lot of people are going down to Disney. Um, okay. Uh, well, I think I'm gonna let you guys go. It's been a long night. We really appreciate you um, hanging out. Your Gabriel wants to come say goodbye. <laughs> and we will leave you guys on the pirates. Take care, and we will see you real soon. Bye, guys. Oh my god, it's probably too dark. <laughs> dark.
Hey, send him him for Davy Jones. He's a rum bear. Oh, oh,
Just think, all of this is yours. Forever. 